All right, I'll begin again. Good morning and welcome to the Bureau of Automotive Repair Advisory Group meeting, the fourth and final meeting for calendar year 2023. My name is Patrick DeRay, Chief of the Bureau of Automotive Repair, and I want to say it's very nice to see everyone, and I'm hoping everyone had as nice a summer as I did. I really enjoyed it. Um, I know we all thought summer was coming to an end, although the temperatures don't reflect that. Today it's supposed to be 92, so I just, uh, um, it's, it's proof that, uh, that summer's still continuing. Uh, and then we always know with uh, Zach's wardrobe. Uh, he's he's finally stopped wearing shorts to the office, but I think he's going to be back doing that again. So we're all on pins and needles to find out what his fall wardrobe is going to be like. Uh, let's begin with the introduction of our advisory group members. Um, we'll start to the far right of me, Ruben. Hi, everybody. I'm Ruben Para with California Automotive Teachers. Good morning, everyone. Matt Webb with the Preventative Automotive Maintenance Association, uh, formerly the AOCA, which was the Automotive Oil Change Association. Jack Moladonna for representing the California Auto Body Association. Thank you. Dave Robinette representing Inter-Industry Conference and Auto Collision Repair, or ICAR. Uh, Dave Cusa with Automotive Service Councils of California. Johan Gallo, California Automotive Business Coalition. Tess Dubois-Carey, Universal Technical Institute. Bud Rice with Cal, uh, Cal ABC. I'm sitting in for Nikki Ayers today. Jeff Cox, the Automotive Maintenance and Repair Association. Gary Conover with the California Automotive Wholesalers Association, your friendly auto supply parts store. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. We also have a few members who are participating via the WebEx. This is a hybrid in person and virtual meeting. Uh, the meeting is also being webcast, and we'll introduce uh, all of the members who are attending remotely. I know at least one of, or maybe two, are here. Let's, Anthony Bento, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I apologize I'm not there in person, but I got a nasty, nasty cough right now. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing you all in the new year um, in person again. But uh, to think I'm doing, I hope I'm doing all of you a favor to not be around me right now. <laughs> I'm not sure if he said it, but Anthony's with. Oh, I meant from the California New Car Dealers Association. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. My apologies, Pat. No, no worries. Good to hear you. And Tim Chang, is Tim there? Yeah, I'm here, Pat. Uh, Tim Chang for the Auto Club of Southern California. Welcome. Any other bar advisory group members or alternates sitting in for an advisory group member who are attending remotely? Is that it? Okay. Uh, as I said, this meeting is being uh, uh, webcast. That's for a recording that'll be available uh, sometime next week if anyone needs to go back and hear something that was said or comment or wants to just have fun and listen to the whole thing again. Uh, that'll be available. Webcaster is Matt Woodcheck. Matt, would you raise your hand there? Uh, we also have a moderator who will help navigate today's meeting with various speakers and public commenters, um, mostly through the well, it'll be strictly through the WebEx uh, format. Uh, Sarah Arani from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you, Sarah, for attending and helping us out today. And then Zach, who we've already introduced, uh, he's our co-moderator and just overall general support for the meeting. If any questions come up please, uh, that you need assistance with, please reach out to Zach during the course of the meeting. Um, also want to introduce the executive leadership team in the Bureau's front office. I'm looking for, you're hiding behind the pillar. No, there's one at least. Bill Thomas, Deputy Chief for Field Operations and Enforcement Division. Clay Leak. Clay, there you are. Clay Leak is with the smog check, I don't know what they call it, smog check operations and information technology division. It's uh, all things smog check, of course, and then our um, 
our IT support for the, the office. Uh, they also have um, the Bureau's roadside program and audits and inspections that fall under, the, under that um, division. And then lastly, Linda Jansen with our Administration Licensing and Consumer Assistance Division. Welcome and thank you for being here. I want to let everyone know that uh, following today's advisory group meeting, we have a workshop that's been scheduled. It'll start at 1.30. It's scheduled for an hour, but it will take as long as, as much time as we need to get through the, uh, the presentation and then respond to all of the questions and comments and concerns uh, um, at the workshop. It's, the topic is teardown disclosure requirements. Um, it could apply to mechanical repairs, I guess, uh, from, but mostly it was designed with the collision repair or auto body repair um, disclosures uh, that are done in the teardown process. I uh, wanted to just recent, give a quick update on some recent happenings um, and some activities that I've been involved in. Uh, yesterday, I attended the California Automotive Business Coalition uh, Lunch and Learn event. I uh, gave them an update on some, some things that the Bureau is working on. You'll hear some of those updates during the course of today's um, meeting with presentations. Um, uh, on October 3rd, I was with the Automotive Service Councils of California, Chapter 20 in Walnut Creek. Uh, Bill and I attended uh, and had a chance to meet and interact with some really great folks from the industry. And I want to encourage all of the Bar Advisory Group members, this was something we used to do pre-pandemic, I want to say, is get out there and, and have those face-to-face -face interactions at the chapter meeting. So please encourage um, your organizations and the chapters. We really value those. I'm not saying that I or Bill or any of the executive leadership could make every one of those, but we certainly have uh, a large enough staff throughout the state uh, to um, fill a chapter meeting with a with a with a presentation. Uh, AB 1263, uh, the Bureau's sunset bill. Good news. The governor, uh, Governor Newsom signed the bill into law on October 10th. You'll hear more about uh, the details of what's in that bill um, from Holly O'Connor and Kayla Shelton um, very shortly. Uh, but I wanted to share one of the important provisions for me, and I know the industry, and I know something that Mr. Gallo has been working on for some time, uh, was recognizing the creation of the Bar Advisory Group and expressing the legislature's intent for Bar to continue ma to maintain the Bar Advisory Group and advise us on regulatory issues and programs affecting the automotive repair industry. It's something that I had always committed to for the last 20 plus years that I've been um, involved in in the bureau's uh, policy making and front office decisions, but I know that um, as Johan or John has said, it's we don't know who's coming after you, and if there will be a continued commitment to do that. And I understood that and supported the idea of getting that mentioned in the bill. So it's very good, very good that the governor um, signed that bill with that inclusion of that. The bill also will extend the bureau's um effective dates another 40 years where we'll go through another sunset review process probably have another bill to clean up various items that have come to our attention between now and 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 four years from now but uh good news on that that the governor signed the, the bill after a very long and exhausting process that kind of began with us publishing a report that uh in january of this year that was um we started writing um back in July of last year. So it's a, it's a good long 18 month process before you get to the end of it almost. Um, the couple of shout outs that I wanna say with respect to the um, sunset review process. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank the Assembly Business and Professions Committee, con the consultant, Caitlin Curry. Uh, she was just terrific to work with. She really dove into the issues, asked a lot of great questions of me and the staff. Um, really helped shepherd that bill through the legislative process. We dealt with a few um, concerns and issues that came up through the process. Um, and uh, it was her leadership and um, just really the ability to tackle some really challenging issues um, that helped get us through the process. So I want to thank her. 
Deputy Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs for uh, Legislative Affairs Division, Jennifer Samoz. Uh, thank her for her support, uh, helping us um, and me in particular prepare for the hearing uh, that was done back in March um, and uh, just overall support of our organization. Tessa Miller, Tessa, where are you? Tessa, she is amazing uh, in her job. She organized the entire effort in getting the report published back in January. She helped us with uh, drafting of the bill language through various staff, getting it all approved through the department. Um, it's, um, it's a really unique job that she holds and a very important one. And I, I really want to thank her for her efforts. And lastly, before we get into the agenda, I want to talk about some an initiative, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative. We're pleased to announce this important initiative that's aimed at enhancing our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last year, Governor Newsom signed Executive Order N-16-22, which mandates that all state agencies and departments take additional actions to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion analysis and considerations into their strategic plans and to develop DEI objectives to guide policies, programs, and services. As a first step, we are seeking participation from all of our stakeholders in a short survey, and the responses from the survey will be used to guide the development of actionable actionable DEI objectives for the Bureau's strategic plan. The survey should take about three to five minutes to complete. All responses are confidential and anonymous. And we ask that everyone uh, in our advisory group members in particular, but all stakeholders, please complete the survey by November 17th, 2023. You can discuss, or excuse me, you can access the survey on our website. That's bar.ca.gov. We have also sent email notifications to all bar staff and stakeholders. So you might be getting this message from me for the for the at least the second time. Your participation in the survey will help us foster an inclusive and engaging work environment that leverages diversity for the benefit of all employees, licensees, and the consumers that bar serves. Thank you for allowing me that time to deliver that message. All right, we will begin with, is there any questions, comments about my welcome and introductory remarks? Oh. Okay, we'll move forward with our first presentation. Legislation regulations update from Holly O'Connor and Kayla Shelton with the Bureau's Executive Office. Good morning, everyone. I'm Holly O'Connor. Good morning. I'm Kayla Shelton. Um, we are the legislative and regulatory specialists here at BAR, and we are going to update you on legislation and the regulation packages that we are working on. Uh, first off, these are some important legislative dates. October 14th was the last day for the governor to sign or veto bills. Um, statues statutes take place or take effect i'm sorry on january 1st of 2024 and the legislature reconvenes on january 3rd um, and as we always try to ensure everything on the slides is the most current um, given the nature of this process um, the most current updates are available um, at legginfo.legislature.ca.gov um, and that website is on these slides and on our website as well these are the legislative bills that we have been tracking this year. Five of them were signed, one was vetoed, and one was moved to the inactive file. The first one that was passed was AB 641, which is on the next slide. Um, this was approved by the governor on uh, October 8th. 
And uh, this bill revised the definition of an automobile dismantler to include a person who keeps or maintains on their property um, or in their possession or control two or more unregistered motor vehicles that are no longer intended for or in condition to use on highways um, or possess nine or more used catalytic converters that have been cut from a motor vehicle using a sharp implement. Um, this, however, does not apply to vehicles or catalytic converters that are used for restoration or replacement parts or to a junk dealer, recycler, commercial enterprise, or core recycler. The next bill, uh, which Pat touched on, is 1263, our sunset review bill. Um, this, as Pat said, extends our sunset date to January 2028. Um, it, amends the definition of automotive repair dealer to include someone who collects compensation for automotive repair services or sublets them to someone who is not their employee or the dealer. Um, this authorizes BAR to adopt regulations to clarify the authority to regulate storage fees for automotive repair dealers. Um, this one we are beginning to work on regulation text for. Um, this authorizes BAR to establish a centralized testing network, network for inspecting model year 1995 and older vehicles that do require a BAR 97 inspection, um, which may include subcontracted uh, licensed smog check stations. Um, the next slide, um, beginning no sooner than January 1st, 2025, testing using onboard diagnostic systems will be required on model years 1996 to 1999. Uh, this is currently done um, on model year 2000 and newer. So they're adding four years to that. Um, the bill specifies that BAR um, continues to maintain this advisory group, as Pat had said, which is great. Um, it provides that any employee of an ARD who was involved in a violation resulting in a citation um, may also be required to attend remedial training uh, with that ARD to prevent disclosure of the citation. Um, and we did finish our citation program, so any required amendments um, will be made. Um, the, this slide, let's see, the term qualified smog check technician refers to both smog check repair technicians and smog check inspectors, um, both of which are already defined in regulation. Um, a fraudulent inspection includes clean plugging, clean gassing, clean tanking, or any fraudulent inspection practice. And uh, these terms are defined in regulation and in the amendments uh, we will be working on. Uh, this bill also makes technical cleanup updates to the business and professions code and to the vehicle code um, to transition the lamp and brake programs to the vehicle safety systems inspection program, uh, which we will have an update on very shortly. And finally, this bill requires the seller of a salvaged vehicle to provide the purchaser a valid vehicle safety systems certificate prior to or at the time of delivery for sale. Uh, the next bill that was approved by the governor, this was filed with the Secretary of State on October 13th. And this prohibits any person from removing or altering the VIN number that has been added to a catalytic converter or knowingly possessing three or more catalytic converters that have a removed or altered VIN number. Uh, next is SB 55, which was also approved and followed with the Secretary of State on October 13th. Um, this bill prohibits a dealer or retailer from selling a vehicle equipped with a catalytic converter unless that catalytic converter has been permanently marked with the VIN number to the vehicle that it is attached to. Um, until January 1st, 2025, this does not apply to a vehicle purchased from a dealer that is licensed in California and also licensed in another state that does not have a warranty service facility in California. Um, also, until January 1st, 2025, it does not apply to collector cars or motorcycles. 
and Kayla will update you on the rest of the bills. So SB 429 was actually vetoed on October 8th. Um, this bill would have provided a definition for a transportation network company. Um, additionally, it would have defined what a personal vehicle is under that uh, program. Uh, the bill also would have required that any personal vehicles operating under this transportation network company uh, to meet inspection requirements done at a bureau licensed facility. But as I stated, this bill was vetoed. All right, so SB 544, uh, the Bag Leaking Open Meeting Act, uh, was approved by the governor and filed with the Secretary of State on September 22nd. Uh, this bill does allow uh, for the continuation of virtual meetings as long as there's one physical location available for people to uh, attend the meeting at. Um, it requires all meeting information, so the, the address, the phone number, um, website, and things like that to be posted on the meeting notice that's distributed. Um, and this bill also allows any advisory group members to continue to attend uh, remotely um, as well as in person. All right, and then SB 301 was ordered to the inactive file on September 13th. Um, this bill would have provided uh, consumers a rebate for any eligible vehicles that were converted to a zero emission vehicle status. Um, and those funds would have come out of the uh, California Air Resources Board Clean Vehicle Rebate Program. Uh, but as I stated, it was ordered to the inactive file. Okay. Um, oh, yes, Pat. Let's open it up to see if there's any, just it's a long presentation to see if there's any questions or comments regarding the legislation portion of your presentation. This is Anthony from the California New Car Dealers. Um, yes. I, I had a, just a quick comment. Um, thank you so much for the helpful information on SB 55, which is the catalytic converter marking bill. I think it, um, I think it would also be important to note that there's an option in the bill uh, that allows a dealer to offer catalytic converting is an optional product on the pre-contract disclosure statement. Um, and then the customer would be able to opt out of that if that's not something that they want. So it's a little bit of a kind of a nuance there, but um, something to uh, something certainly to note um, because there is an exception to that general rule that catalytic converters be marked prior to sale. Thank you, Anthony, for pointing out that piece of the legislation. Mr. Maladonov, Jack Maladonov. I just want to make a comment on AB uh, 1263. <clears throat> I know, Pat, you talked about it, and there were a lot of provisions in there. But the one that would maintain this body here, um, I know uh, the associations uh, that I represent supported the bill, the California Auto Body Association, the Automotive Service Councils of California. Uh, but there was one individual who really worked on this for the last several years, um, and there's a lot of work done behind the scenes, and it was uh, Johan Gallo of the uh, Cal ABC who um, made this his pet project, and he really worked hard on it because these the, these provisions just don't pop up in the middle of the night like a mushroom. Uh, there's work done, and uh, he did quite a bit of work on this uh, to negotiate the language because I know there was some resistance, and that took some time. Finally got it done, and this section is... Usually you put the intent language in the beginning under findings, and it sort of gets lost when, when, when bills pass. This was actually codified in a section, business and profession section 9880.4, which is unusual. I mean, there was discussions with legislative council on this. And, and uh, anyway, it's in the statute. And I just wanted to uh, recognize Johan Gallo, who really did a lot of work uh, on this to get this done. And I think the statute, you know, this 9880.4 should be called the Johan Gallo statute. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that recognition of Mr. Gallo. And Mr. Gallo has uh, requested a speaking opportunity here. Yeah, you know, I'm. I'm taken back because this whole project started in 1996 with a summit that Cal ABC held. And it had not been for the work that Chris Walker did at the time with Marty Keller, myself, a lot of the members of Cal ABC now. Um, 
we would have never gotten the executive order from Governor Wilson that started the advisory in 1998. Fast forward, Chief DeRay and I had had several conversations with AB 1263. It's the sunset bell, it's the big bill. And so to make a long story short, uh, we had many conversations about, we need to codify this. And I understood the chief's resistance in doing so because codifying things sometimes makes you lose control of the very thing you're trying to do. And so after, as Jack Maldonoff said, a lot of conversations, a lot of back and forth, give and take, we finally came up with workable language that Chief DeRay, myself, Jack, Cal ABC could work with and agree to because at some point in time, and you'll learn a little bit about this later, um, we're all going to hit the door and we're going to retire. We're going to move on. Life goes on. We've had at least two chiefs in the past that tried to kill the advisory. I look at BAR's history and I was telling Chief DeRay yesterday, well, we had the summit in 1996. It was after a month of me researching why BAR was created in the first place. I understand why Reagan did it because there were so many people being ripped off by automotive repair. And the worst case that was cited was on the Baker grade going to Las Vegas where moms and children were being held hostage while the dad went and got money because they wouldn't take a check for the fraudulent repairs they did. So I understood the mission of the bar better than many people sitting in the room today that may even work for bar. So fast forward, we finally get the legislation that we need, hoping it gets signed. It did get signed, and we couldn't have done it without Chief DeRay, without Jack Maladonoff, and everybody on Cal ABC with all the oars in the water getting this thing done. And for that, I'm ever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, Bud Rice. Yes, hi, Bud Rice. I wanted to talk about 1263 as well. Um, we had a chance to talk a little bit yesterday about the one provision that, um, let's see, where is it here? That basically, it sets up a centralized testing network for inspecting older vehicles. And, and my thought about that is a, a, a couple of things. One is the number of those vehicles continues to go down. I'm not clear as to how many there actually are in the marketplace today, but it's interesting how the market doesn't lie. And as much as you might want to try to make changes and influence the market, the market usually will win. So the point is, is that as those number of vehicles go down, shops then have to make a decision as to whether or not there's an economic benefit to them to stay in that market and service an ever shrinking number of vehicles while you're paying for and maintaining the equipment that goes along with doing that. So again, the market starts to speak and you're gonna notice a number of uh, automotive uh, facilities that had offered that service in the past will start to uh, pull out. So the, the state has to have a mechanism to try to accommodate those people that still own those vehicles and need to have an inspection done with perhaps an ever shrinking number of shops that are involved. That's why I think you went to the centralized option so that if in fact the market needs more testing, there's a, 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 a vehicle, you know, an avenue for them to be able to, to do that. So I, I'd like to see the market still be able to compete and still be able to participate. And so those uh, shops that want to uh, continue to operate. I think there's a provision in that mm -hmm. as well. So if you're a star station and you do newer vehicles and you want to do older vehicles, there's an avenue for you to participate so long as your performance level is acceptable. Um, and then if you choose not to participate, the state has the ability to still uh, help and uh, service those vehicles that are still out in the field. So I just wanted to make that comment, uh, Chief. Thank you. You're hired. That was really good. <laughs> I, yeah, that's it. Additional comments? Okay, let's go to the regulations portion. Then we'll open up for larger public comment on the entire presentation. 
All right. Thank you, Zach. Um, so not much has changed in regards to regulations that have so far been adopted in 2023. Um, we did have the um, ARD registration application requirements that was adopted in May and was effective July 1st of this year. Uh, the second package that completed the process was the citation and remedial training programs for ARDs uh, that was adopted also in May and also effective on July 1st. We do have pending regulation packages. Uh, we do have the Vehicle Safety Systems Inspection Program, uh, the ARD registration renewal requirements, uh, smog check inspection equipment and station requirements. This is the DAD specification update package. And lastly, we have some uh, consumer assistant program incentive increases. Uh, so, as we have discussed previously, um, the vehicle safety systems inspection program package will do several things. Um, it is meant to sunset the lamp and brake inspection program 6 months after the adoption of the regulations. Uh, this package will establish procedures and program requirements as well as a vehicle safety systems inspection manual. Um, and it does create license requirements for the vehicle safety systems inspections and repair stations and technicians. We have held several workshops from 2022 uh, throughout this year. Uh, currently, the package is with agency review. Um, it was sent to agency on September 19th. The next step will be for approval to file with OAL. And at that point, we would begin our public 45 day commenting period. Um, and then we have the ARD registration renewal requirements. Um, this package will require ARDs um, renewing the registration to use the prescribed forms. And these prescribed forms will collect the newly required information pursuant to AB 471. AB 471 uh, is requiring us to collect a couple more pieces of information. So what this package will do, it will require any ARDs renewing their registration. To, it would allow us to collect any of that new information. Um, and it does specify that registration expires one year from the last date of that month, unless all that information is provided. Um, I do have an update to the status. As of yesterday, it was just moved out of agency review and was submitted for OAL's review. At this point, they have 30 days to review the package, um, after which hopefully it'll be adopted. Thank you. This next one is our dad specification update. For those of you that are not familiar with this package yet, um, it replaces the current OBD dad specification with a more comprehensive and updated version. And it allows the dad to communicate with new vehicles that use a communication protocol that is not supported by the current generation of dads. Um, we are still working with DCA legal. Um, it is going to move to executive legal staff within the next couple days and i am actually excited to for january when i will have another great update <laughs> um, and then our last package is the consumer assistance program incentive uh, increases uh, this package would increase the vehicle retirement program incentives and the repair assistance program contributions um, as well as allow the Bureau to increase those amounts every three years if there has been a 10% increase in the consumer price index. Um, and this package also removes the eligibility restriction preventing motorists from participating in the repair assistance program more than once. And finally, it unincorporates the CAP application um, and lists the application requirements in regulation. Um, this package has been approved by DCA legal and will be sent to agency within the next week or so. And that is it for our regulations. Any questions about those packages? Anything from the advisory group members sitting here on the dais at the dais with me? Uh, any advisory group members attending remotely? Any comments about the entire presentation, legislation, and regulations update. Hearing none, we'll 
ask the moderator to open it up for public comment on this specific agenda item. All right, this is the moderator and at the uh, direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q and a feature for public comment members of the public. If you would like to make a comment on this item, please either use the Q and a icon located at the bottom corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we do have a request for comment from Lawrence Wales. Lawrence, I'll request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. There are a couple of things I'd like to do for the new thing. One, stop showing the exceptions for the, for the vehicles we are testing. It's bad enough that you have them, even when the vehicle can be fixed. But to show them to the technicians when they're doing this mock test is telling us that the program is useless. For those vehicles quite often. It gives us that feeling that what's the purpose of the program? And I'd like to get an updated list of usable barcode scanners. A lot of them are no longer available. And the bar 97, my machine was down for about 19 days because the technician went on vacation. And he was so over when he came back that he made mistakes. So for about two thirds of the month, my machine was down and we lost us about a thousand dollars because of that. So I'd like it to be required that it be repaired promptly. And if they don't do it in a couple of days, make them credit our account with at, at the very least the rental or service contract pricing for that time period, preferably double that to give them a penalty and an encouragement to hire sufficient people to do the job. And what are people with, ex with the catalytic converters already installed on the car without the VIN marking supposed to do in order to be able to sell the car because you're and when shop Tesla requires the customer or their insurance to pay for any act for any damage that happens to their car while it is in their re repair shop, that should not be allowed. If the repair shop causes problem causes an accident on your vehicle, the shop should be liable, not the customer. Tesla requires that. I learned that recently. And this is not VAR or even DC, even the Department of Consumer Affairs, but Tesla advertises their since their enhanced and enhanced and full and that full self driving features as if they're available. Older people can easily make the mistake and get screwed by them. Has happened to me. I cannot turn around and sell the car because I get got so many incentives on it because I'm not exactly high income, I'm low income. <laughs> and employers should be allowed to fire employees to prevent a recurrence and not be punished for it. If they fire the employee that caused the shop to be cited. And there's still a barcode scanner software issue. I believe it might be the client software instead of the server because you did three updates for the server, but none for the client to fix the problem. Sometimes I have to scan three or four times before it scans correctly. And sometimes I'm just plain not able to, like on some of the Hyundais, it still doesn't, it doesn't scan correctly, period. And employee employers should be allowed to fire employees that caused the citation should have been required to make 
to keep that employee so they can go through the so they can require them to go through the remedial training. Thank you. Mr. Wells, thank you for your comments. Um, if you could leave your contact information with the moderator, um, um, Sarah, if you could um, obtain that, we'd like to follow up with you with respect to some of the issues relating to the smog check equipment. And also, I noticed pharma. Will the once the and also another question. Once the. 90, 96 to 99 are converted to the OIS and the. And the 95 and older are, are done by a centralized facility. Will we still be required? Will the star station still be required to have the bar 97 equipment? Most likely not. It'll be optional um, under that uh, centralized, uh, hybrid centralized uh, network uh, that's managed most likely by a, a, a vendor uh, that is contracted with that is contracted with the bureau to perform those services and manages those services. But as Mr. Rice pointed out, there is uh, the flexibility that's provided to the bureau to. Uh, develop a hybrid network uh, of existing licensed smog check test only uh, test only and test and repair stations that are most likely star certified. So well, this, well, the bar the ability to have a, a to be required uh, to have that equipment be star what's certified. The, what's that? Will the star stations be required to have the bar ninety seven e equipment to be star certified? Does it make all it, it hasn't been determined yet. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing as we move towards that centralized, decentralized hybrid model for inspecting those older vehicles, that that requirement would be eliminated. But I'm not going to commit to that. I haven't. We haven't taken a stand on that just yet. I think there wouldn't be the need for requiring that unless you were testing those cars. So if you wanted to be a star station and did not opt in to testing those older vehicles therefore you would you would be allowed to get into star and just focus on the newer vehicles great i i like that another thing i'd like is the my bar 97 was down for almost two-thirds of a month last month because <laughs> one tech went on vacation and there was nobody to cover for him so he had so there were all these phone calls, so he couldn't get to people right away, and he was rushing, and he made more mistakes. So I ended up not being able to do a, a whole bunch of smogs because of that. I'd like it to. I'd like there to be some sort of penalty for them if it's not fixed within a couple of days, like double the, the lease or service contract agreement. about for the all the down days if they don't fix it within say two or three days all right thank you for your comments uh mr wales and uh if the moderator can get your contact information we will follow up on those uh challenges you've been experienced with the equipment provider and also the the comments you made regarding the um, barcode scanners and and uh the need for an updated list i'd like to learn more about that in that request um, when we contact you. Any other comments from anyone else out there, moderator? Uh, yes. Um, so next I have um, Gary Zaperzalka. I apologize if I uh, mispronounced your last name. Uh, I'll request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Uh, and Mr. Zapperzalka, um, I see that your microphone's unmuted, but I'm not hearing any audio. Mm. 
Moderator, I'm going to move on. Uh, we've got a busy agenda, and there'll be okay. there'll be opportunities to weigh in uh, with public comment um, on the other agenda items, and then there's a a overall general public comment period for all things that aren't on the agenda. Uh, any other comments from the public, either on the remote attendees uh, or here in person? about this agenda item. Uh, this is the moderator it appears. There's no request, no further requests for comment uh, on WebEx. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holly and Kayla. We will move forward with our next presentation from one of our own Bar Advisory Group members, Tess Dubois-Carey from the Universal Technical Institute. UTI here in Sacramento was at the facility yesterday. Very nice place to a nice school. I mean, just a great, great setup there. Uh, the presentation today is on career training in transportation, energy, and skilled trades. Welcome and thank you for this presentation. I know we had it scheduled for July and we had some issues come up. I, I, I uh, can't remember what it was. You might have been ill. I don't or out of the out of town. I can't remember. But it was a, it was a health mishap that I'm happy to have behind me. So. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> Whatever the case, we're happy to have you back giving this presentation. And I know you did uh, give this or a similar presentation to another advisory group, our educational advisory group, back in I want to say May. May. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Chief Saray, thank you and advisory group. Thank you for the time today to talk about training in career transportation. I'm the campus president. I've been with UTI for 13 years now, 2015 in my current role. So it's been some time. We'll move to the next slide. So what you see here is a map of all of our locations. We've been supporting the trades for over 50 years. Uh, each of the color circles represents one of our core programs. So they're all color coordinated. We have different offerings at different campuses, 16 campuses nationwide. We're continuing to grow. We just opened a campus in Austin, Texas this past year, as well as Miramar right outside of Miami this past year to, as we will speak to later, handle the demand, which I'm sure everybody in this room is uh, quite familiar with. So the offerings that we have here in the Sacramento location, we have auto diesel. And then I'm happy to say this last July, we opened our welding program. So we have 56 booths. Uh, we have been full. So I'm in a position where I've been clo closing each of the welding starts in advance because we have such capacity, such uh, demand for the program itself. We're running three sessions of the welding program. So essentially we're six hours a day, Monday through Friday. It's a nine month program in partnership with Lincoln Electric. Everything from MIG, TIG, GWA, uh, pipe cutting, pipe fitting, fabrication, it's all inclusive. And we run from six in the morning till midnight, Monday through Friday. So three separate sessions. So there is an opportunity, for example, somebody working say that full-time nine to five, they could still, if should they choose or desire, come and take that nine month program six to midnight. There is not an online component to that program. So we're very excited to have that offering here at the location. And you can see the other, you have the handout, uh, the other, um, oh, I guess there was a, a bit of a test there. So we'll move to the next slide if we dive in a little bit deeper. The types of training that UTI handles is transportation, energy, and manufacturing. So we have expanded. Many may know us as auto diesel collision, but there's many other offerings. We have marine, motorcycle, NASCAR. On the energy side, there's wind energy. Um, of our, once we acquired MIAT located in Canton, Ohio, and Houston, Texas, we began a process of program expansion within our existing. UTI campuses to incorporate things like robotics, wind energy at the various locations. That's why in the prior slide, there were so many different color circles because the offerings are going to continue to expand. And of course, manufacturing, you can see there the, the offerings, welding being one of them, 
for the manufacturing side. So we'll move to the next slide. I'd say one of the things that makes UTI unique is our manufacturer partnerships. And as part of those partnerships, we have what we nickname MSAT. It stands for Manufacturer Specific Advanced Training. And there we have two different types. There's both student paid and manufacturer paid. So essentially our core programs on that initial slide, all those color circles, the core programs offer that basic fundamentals to be entry level in that core area. The manufacturer specific advanced trainings are opportunities for students to take it a step further, get additional training in a variety of different areas. So on student paid, I'll use the Sacramento campus as an example. We have the Ford program. So somebody either taking the auto or auto diesel could also add on Ford. It's a 15 week add on. You have to have again, the core program under your belt, so to speak, to be able to sign up for it. But it's a 15 week, it's Ford curriculum. They would achieve 12 of the 15 Ford certifications, which could otherwise take you a significant amount of time to accomplish should you be employed in a dealership and then go off and uh, achieve those separately. And there's a tremendous amount in that particular program of EV, electrical. So the benefit of a student paid, although it doesn't sound like a benefit to a student, the phrase student paid, the benefit to them is to obtain this knowledge. There's no obligation to go work for Ford. Ford would want to obtain all of the graduates from that program given their demand needs, but the marketability for that particular student, and this is just one example, we have them across campuses. Manufacturer paid on the flip side, there's a bit more of an obligation, although there's still not a guarantee. We do not guarantee employment, although our, our facts and figures are, are quite high in that arena. There's more of a, there's an interview process. Um, there's Peterbilt, Fent, um, Porsche, those are the types of uh, manufacturer partners that have manufacturer paid. So their expectation is, hey, we're gonna pay for you to go through our advanced training, but we are gonna interview you. We have criteria on GPA attendance. We're gonna take what we were considering to be the upper echelon to go through. And then we expect you to come work for us unless they decide that that's not going to be a, a winning solution at the end of the opportunity. I point all this out not because just the um, plethora of options for students to consider and the pathways, but it's very easy within our network for students to go campus to campus. Because you might be thinking, gosh, if Sacramento only has Ford, but a Sacramento-based individual wants to do Cummins and Cummins PowerGen in Arizona, how does that work? Well, we partner with housing vendors we have it at every campus. And what they do is they take chunks of apartment complexes, varying complexes at different tier levels, right? You're gonna have basic on up to luxury and it's fully furnished. The student would sign a lease with our third party vendor. It's run like a college dorm, like what many of you may remember and recall, we have um, student RAs that get free rent as their reimbursement for the types of things. There's activities. There's under and over 21, which you can probably gather what some of the differences would be in those two dynamics. So it becomes very easy if, if somebody is leaving that situation, you're still on the hook for your portion of your rent for however long or short you choose to be within that program. So it makes it very easy for a student say, local to Sacramento, I wanna do auto diesel Ford, and then I wanna go, in this example that I was sharing, to Avondale and do Cummins, because then they would just go into that housing situation. And I will add that I use that auto diesel Ford Cummins example, because my son is that example. He's about a year in, and you know, Johan's laughing, because I have to do a proud mom moment. He's 4.0, perfect attendance, he works full time, just got a promotion last week. He's now senior meat clerk. So I have a little butcher in the family um, over at Sprouts. And he does also work part-time for the city of Lincoln, clearing softball fields, doing a variety of tasks. So that is the path that he's 
choosing and electing. Um, but there are many paths and the more we can educate and and help folks understand the various career pathway choices, the better off. So I, I spend a lot of time on that slide. No fear, I won't spend that much time on every slide, but we can move to the next one. This one may also be a little bit more lengthy, but I'll do my best. Um, our education model really is the best of both worlds. So we have a combination, every course is three weeks in length. So you're in breaks, three weeks, only breaks. Then you're gonna move on to undercar, three weeks, only undercar, on down the line. Program lengths vary depending on what you're electing. We talked a little bit about the combinations. You could be in as short as the nine month welding program, and you can be for a couple of years, just depending on what your particular selection is. And you're there on campus Monday through Friday. For the auto diesel, I already shared welding is six hours a day. Auto diesel, you're in lab on campus three hours a day, it's every day, Monday through Friday. Attendance is quite, quite strict. That is part of the career readiness <laughs> program. And the blended portion, there's, I like to say three hours, but it's probably two hours because then the students can remember three hours a day on campus, three weeks every class, three hours a day homework. That's going to be your online component. That's all of our lectures are online, gives the students an opportunity to pause, rewatch. You can't do that in a live version. You can't say, oh, Mr. Mansu, can you pause for a minute? I'm going to run down and, and get a Coke and a bag of Doritos. That just, that's not an equation that we had before. So it allows for consistency and delivery of the material. We've gone back and hired you know, marketing and really snazzed up those videos where you have like graphics and and things occurring to keep that attention, because I'm sure you can imagine that's not the students favorite portion. The way the curriculum is written, it demands them to stay on track because they can't they're not test and quiz eligible should they not be caught up. So it really it trains them for organizational skills much better than we ever had in the past because you just don't have the ability to persist if you get behind. It just doesn't happen. You'll fill out that course very, very quickly and fraction out. There's a whole process that, that's involved. It's very, um, very strict. So students have that online portion. The lectures are online. There's interactive online learning, um, which is really neat because you can heavy car parts, you can see them interactively moving and see what's underneath, what's spinning. I did do uh, an interactive online learning on catalytic converters and not being a car person, I was proud to get a 75%, at least I passed. <laughs> so, but it's good to experience, you know, what are these things? What are they like? And there's other components. I heard yesterday from a speaker at our meeting about the importance of service writing and writing those service order. And, you know, today's generation are texting and acronyms and, you know, it's kind of a lost skill, cursive, you know, all those things are just part of our history books. We do have, and not to belabor, the whole process of threaded discussions and uh, process analysis where every student has to participate in threaded discussions, meaningful. They have to ha talk about themes. They have to do a program process analysis. Week two of every three week phrase talk phase talking about what are they learning? What do they like best? It, it causes them to have to think and form sentences. So again, not their favorite. They can't pass the course without completing those elements. And that's part of the program. They have to do that. So it's they're getting skills that industry loves because they're coming out, our graduates are coming out more prepared than ever, having the opportunity to have this type of training added into the hands-on. The hands-on time is the same, but rather than the other time sitting in a class lecture, they're having all of these engagement opportunities. So as far as the hands-on side, similar to what you may have been or may not have been familiar with, they work in groups of four in lab groups, they get opportunities. You know, I hear the feedback from my son, like, man, I was doing all the work for that group. And, you know, and then he stayed for a, a mid session to finish the lab so that the group would then have to finish on their own. <laughs> so there's, you know, they have learnings on how to deal with certain situations. And um, I'm 
my son is learning organically because the students don't know who his mother is. So it's um, a gr good opportunity for him to have those types of learnings. And I don't steer, I just yeah. listen and say, what, what's your plan? Same as I would do any, any student. So we can move to the next slide. Um, as with anybody, we have to focus on the future. Everybody in this room knows what's going on now with EV and where we're headed. UTI is no different. We have to make sure that the technicians that we're training are going to be able to have that knowledge. So we have already in place a three-week course that's embedded into our core automotive election. And so all automotive, if it's a diesel only student, they won't have this training. They would have to have automotive in their program, um, but it goes into high voltage vehicle operation, um, diagnosis and service. You can kind of you know, read the offerings there. We did also uh, make a decision to pilot in Sacramento this coming January an advanced EV course. So we'll have an additional three weeks added in for advanced EV training. I have two Mach-E's coming and two Fiat 500E's coming as well for the training aids for that particular course. So there's some excitement around the added training and UTI's goal is to get that exposure. You know, I spoke at a couple of slides ago about all the manufacturer specific training and the different pathways and options. It's our job to make sure we're training for an entry level technician, but giving them exposure in all areas so that they can make then the choice that's gonna make the most sense for themselves. And then of course that training never stops. Employer partners are gonna keep training online, like so they're already ready to do that. And that path is gonna continue with whatever that employer partner is. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. Um, just like to include a, a quote from our CEO there. I won't read it word for word because um, I trust everybody's ability to do so should they desire. Um, so we'll move to the next slide and move into demand. So you can see here, again, the number of vehicles worldwide in the U.S. and the total um, combined welders and uh, diesel technicians, is, the demand is significant. Um, We've added campuses, as I've mentioned previously, and we're gonna to continue to focus on both the high school and the adult populations to drive enrollment and interest into this field. Um, we have a high school team that focuses on making presentations and doing a variety of different things in the high schools. I've gone and, and they're really, um, focused on making sure you have a plan. It doesn't have to be a UTI plan, but it has to be a plan, do something. And there's a, a good, like a self-test involved with kind of like, where are you, you know, best suited? What kinds of things do you like? And, you know, the, the field team does a nice job with a tape measure, right? Showing like the average US lifespan and kind of where that high school student falls in terms of right now on that tape measure. And then, hey, this is a tough one, right? You got to make a decision of what this rest of this time frame, this 50 some odd years is going to look like for you or 40 some odd years. And it's a big decision, but take on the information, learn what you want to do. Don't be influenced by others in terms of just going to where your friends are going take a look within. So the presentation is less of like that dog and pony, cha 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 you know, come to UTI. It's more of a search within and should UTI be, hey, here's a QR code we can talk about that separately. So it's, um, it's very well done. I felt like it was kind of giving back to the next generation just in general, because it's like the plan is not sit on mom's couch and play video games. That's not called a plan. <laughs> That's called a failure. <laughs> so. Um, and on the adult side, we have similar types of activities as they just look different. We do have two events um, coming up. I'll just make mention uh, this coming Saturday, we have our national open house. I think right now we have over a hundred that are RSVP as not the guest numbers, but as uh, future potential students that are coming in, we'll be running some demos, dyno, um, we'll have some welding demos. So that'll be an event that, uh, uh, it will be a, a good one. The following weekend, the 28th of October, 
on Saturday is the STEM and educator event. So we do this on a regular interval. They can get actually credit for attending the seminar as well as teachers and counselors, but we bring them in and help educate them on what this career pathway is. And then they go through a series of STEM seminars at various checkpoints with my instructor team. They, um, and it's very STEM related. I mean, they're, they're having to learn, like our students learn Ohm's law it's not what people are, th it's tough, it's rigorous. It's there's studying, there's, you know, just other things that you would think outside of that stereotype of a, of a technician. So those are two events I just make mention and we can move to the next slide. This is just a visual to capture the demand. Um, you know, at any given moment, you could have just in California, 20,000 job postings for graduate em employment. So it's huge. We had a uh, career fair. Johan was um, able to, to attend as well and, and come meet some folks, but we had 60 employers, which is a, a, an average number for us, a good number, but a, what we tend to have in partnership. And they were collectively looking for a thousand job openings for our graduates. And this is, industries that you just wouldn't even imagine it wouldn't come top of mind but it was pretty exciting it's a great motivator for our active students um, we have it outside so we can bring in all kinds of equipment and bells and whistles and things for them to touch and feel and um, so and we bring them you know the students get filtered out in phases so that it's not like everybody rushing and then nobody really gets time to to speak so it's a um, kind of, I would say, a well orchestrated day so that there can be quality interactions and some interviews on the spot. But that just speaks to the type of demand we're talking about. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this one's probably a favorite around the board because it's trip. And I always tell the students it's not the vacation that you don't get to have for the next year or so while you're in school because it's just Christmas week is the only time we close, the other time you're here every single day. It stands for tuition reimbursement incentive plan and essentially we have over 5000 employer partners, not to be confused with manufacturer specific partners, but employer partners that have signed agreements with UTI to pay for things like tuition reimbursement relocation um, incentives tools allowance a variety of different benefits to go work for them. And they want the UTI graduate not only because of the training that they're receiving, the quality in the curriculum, but also for some of the things that I'll speak to later that pertain on the professionalism side and attendance. You can't graduate from UTI with less than a 90% attendance. You just can't be a graduate. You, you'll have to take a break and come back when you're serious, if that is the case. And if not, that's fine too. There's hopefully another path in the, in the place, but a UTI graduate, even 90% is not the upper echelon. So that's, you know, we, we say 100, do the 99, okay, fine. But you, you know, nobody can even graduate without a 90% attendance. So that makes those graduates highly sought after because it takes that worry. How many people have interviewed folks and you're like, oh, Johnny was great, but is Johnny gonna show up every day? How do you know, <laughs> right? So it, it, it comes up, it happens. So this takes that out of the equation. I'm not saying all my students are perfect. As with anything, there's a bell curve, right? We have a range and that's why we have coaching, guidance, mentoring, and all those fun things in between. But you can see here a few examples. We have benefits packages that go all the way up to $44,000. And I put CarMax on there. That one's a little bit on the lower side, you know, seven, $8,000. There's over 5,000 of them. Um, the students have these accessible to them. Through they have an app, a UTI Go app. They can look at them at any time. Um, we don't overly advertise this program on the admissions side because we never want it to be perceived as a promise because you're not guaranteed to be employed by somebody who's going to pay these benefits. There are opportunities to be employed by somebody who pays these benefits should you persist, do well, and be seen as a good fit by one of our employer partners. There's other opportunities that don't have these benefits. So we always make that quite clear. So I feel obligated to say it here today as well. Uh, moving to the next slide, we do have an early employment program and that's just our commitment to student success while they're going through the program. Our students have to work, you know, many full-time like, like my son and many part-time. 
Um, but early employment is all, a, an agreement also assigned MOU with our partners that allow students to work for them while they're going to school, say a 20 and 30 hour, and then it can turn into um, a bigger role within that organization upon graduation. And then that would also come with tuition reimbursement. So those employers have to be a part of TRIP as well. And the MOU has to be agreed upon, you know, in the world of, you know, fast food workers are going to make $20. You know, they can't say like, okay, we're going to hire your grads making 15. I mean, your active students making 1550. We have to agree upon what's going to be fair in the market for the part-time work while they're active in school. Um, I'll pause here on this slide just for a moment because there's a student success is something that's near and dear to my heart in terms of how we um, provide, how the culture is established at the campus and the professionalism and the offerings that we have to help students that struggle with success. We have a coach team that specifically dedicates all of their time to students in their first five phases. So again, each phase is three weeks. That's where you see that real awakening, right? So Johnny, who maybe, you know, like my son, did not like high school, was a C student. He's an A student at UTI, but they have a coach that helps them with test taking skills, study habits, what's keeping you from doing that proactive management, you know, just really helping them with some of the skills that they may never have been taught ever before. And that's a dedicated focus in that very beginning to help give them the tools to be successful. And then we have things like mock interviews. We have a closed closet for uh, students to borrow clothing for job interviews. You know, maybe they don't have a tie or, you know, or if they want to wear a tie or something a little bit more snazzy for a, a job interview. So there's a variety of benefits. We have a um, employee funded student pantry. So if they're struggling financially, many are, they still have to go through a coaching conversation. Like, are you working? You know, do you know how expensive the cigarettes are? And, you know, I see a Starbucks coffee cup in your hand. Let's talk about what that is. Let's do the math. And, but essentially we'll give them the groceries so they can put gas in their car. You know, gas prices are what gas prices are. And we, we, this employees fund food so that students can get by. It's, you know, it doesn't have a lobster tank or anything like that, but PB and J, mac and cheese, ramen noodles, those types of things so they can get by. Um, that's just to name a few, but student success is something that just doesn't come naturally. They don't just come wrapped up and, you know, you get a percentage that are, and they don't need our help. And there's a big percentage that do need your help and they're not going to ask for it. So we have to have the skill and the team in place to be able to see the signs and be able to figure out how to approach without, um, how to approach successfully. I guess I'll leave it like that. Um, next slide, ways to fund the training. So that's always a big one. We do have over $15 million scholarships and grants. A lot of our grants tend to be need-based. So there's quite a bit of, um, dynamic around that and how we um, determine who would be qualifying for specific grants. Um, students fill out the FAFSA and apply for, for the funds that they would be eligible for, just like any other institution. Um, we have a dedicated financial aid team that helps individually with how do you manage the tuition and how do you look to accomplish that? We have bilingual as well, because we meet with families. It's a, it's a oftentimes it's a, a family decision. Uh, moving to the next slide, and then we can probably quick, quick skip to the one following. This is just a visual uh, reference to the little bit, but you know, in the past, everything, the focus, it, everything's go to college just get into a good college. And it really crippled in some ways the, the industry that we are faced with now, and we have to work hard to change the mindset. You know, us having counselors at the campus and on doing that on a routine basis, we have to continue to chip away at stigma and the thought process and, you know, just where everybody is thinking like college is the place and then this is the place that you go if, if if you can't do that it's not a lesser it's a different and it's about understanding where somebody's passion lies and what their skill set would be best suited for and there's some 
pretty darn good careers to be had um, and outcomes in comparison to if you follow the Department of Education and the white pages and geek out on data like I do, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty impressive to see the difference in the outcomes as well. So it's kind of, you know, I, I encourage everybody when they're looking to make these decisions, do your research. It's a big decision. Think about that tape measure. You know, make sure you know what you're doing and getting into. Um, and then today, it's the focus is to get a good career. So it's just the the visual there towards it starting in middle school and not focused on one path. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So I think I'm kind of hitting up on time here. And this is just like a timing visual. So you can just the, the comparison of some of the options, which are also good options, but there is um, a certain benefit to be able to get out sooner into your career and and be earning faster than some other pathways. So um, I think I've got one more slide here. And this one, we've kind of re referenced it a couple of times, but I think there's a, a survey that was done by Stanley Black and Decker, and essentially 85% of young people did value a skilled trades career. But it's interesting that of the 85% that did say they valued it, 16% were likely to consider that career. So I think we have work to do. And, and what we're talking about here and, and what we're UTI and, and what we're slated to do to try to help with that. Many young people don't have an accurate idea of the required skills. For example, 23% said that skilled trade jobs don't use cutting edge technology when most workers stated they do. And I would challenge anybody to, you know, come on campus and see what, you know, we have we call them robots or our computers everywhere. It's just, it's, it's different. Um, so it's just a changing of the mindset. And then there is an underrepresentation of women um, in the industry. Um, with young women were less than 15% likely to consider skilled trades career. I can tell you the, the females that come through the program do incredibly well. Uh, just in general, they're incredibly well and are great students. And we've seen an increase in our female population. Um, and I make it a point, every female student, I make an introduction, I meet their family. You know, let's face it, they're going to be in a population of all men. So they need to feel comfortable because we take all of those types of things very seriously. Title IX, everything. I mean, anything. It's a very strict environment, professionalism, mm -hmm. um, very, very strict environment. So I guess with that, I will say thank you. And next slide, I'll provide my contact information. Anybody want a tour or has you know more deep dive questions, wants to geek out on any data, um, by all means, reach out and I'm happy to share. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tess, for the excellent presentation. Any questions, comments from the Bar Advisory Group members? Uh, Mr. Gallo. Yeah, just real quick. Um, I had the pleasure of being invited to UTI, not for Cal ABC in a sense, but to come and attend the career fair they had. And I was really impressed by three things. Number one, you had 60 different employers there with a wide variety of different jobs to the organization and seeing 900 students move through this thing and not everybody clamoring to one specific employer, which in my former life, I've spent a lot of time on campuses doing uh, recruiting and career fairs, working many of them. But the thing that really impressed me the most out of all of it was the constant comment from employers about the discipline that you have on your campus in dress code, appearance, safety glasses, hats, She's like walking through the campus with a drill sergeant. I'm telling you, nothing gets by her. And I was really impressed by that. And it shows with the students and the type of employers you attract. So thank, thank you. Thank you, John. I like to call it a fur-lined iron fist. <laughs> Mr. Rice. Um, yes, hi, Bud Rice. Uh, first off, just great presentation. Um, you're awfully shy. I think you're going to work your way out of that eventually. <laughs> no, but you did very good. Um, just, just for the group, uh, go, going back in time a little bit, there was 
uh, uh, high schools had auto shop auto shop classes, and people could go. They could try it, see if they liked it, see if they had um, an interest in, in in moving along with it. And if they did, then use utilizing your your old school uh, flow chart there. Maybe they would go to a JC and then go through auto technology at De Anza College or something like that. Um, tougher today, much tougher today, because all of the schools have basically gotten rid of their auto auto tech programs or auto shop programs, and they've converted them to something else. As soon as they get converted, the chances of turning them back around again are zero, zero. Okay, so if a school has been able to hang on to it, they're lucky. But in most cases, they've they've turned into something else and they're not coming back. Um, but then you're ending up with a JC trying to turn out a number of graduates that can then go out into the field. And the number that a JC can turn out is very modest in terms of how many they can turn out in a given year. So even if you lined up all of the auto technology programs at JCs and looked and see how many people can actually hit the street afterwards, it's really small. And the demand of the industry looking for technicians that they can bring on board, the demand is high, the outflow to the street is low. Okay, so um, in, in many cases, people that had maybe had had a bias towards entering this industry ended up doing something else. They ended up fixing computers or, or you know, fixing photocopy machines and that kind of stuff. People that like to work with their hands but didn't see a pathway to being able to do something that they'd really like to do. Um, I, I said something to your son. I don't know if you, if you heard me or not, but what I said to him yesterday is, if you find something you'll love, you don't work. You'll never work. Okay, so part of this is how do you find that? And I think UTI does a nice job of that. I just wanted to say that. Thank, Thank you. you, bud. Thanks, bud. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Jeff Cox. Yeah. Hi, Jeff Cox, Automotive Maintenance Repair Association. Um, you guys have great brands on the OE side, I, Harley Davidson, Ford. Has there ever been demand from the aftermarket to create a program from, you know, one of those large footprint, I saw CarMax or something like that, to create a program for a more turnkey technician for the aftermarket? We do have a division at our home office that does customization, and there are quite a few things in the works on the EV side with some particular, so there's, there's an opportunity for customization, absolutely. Um, I know that you've you've got some prior connections, but I can certainly, if there's an interest of some sort, we can talk about who the best. Um, sure. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Gary Conover. Uh, Gary Conover with Auto Supply Stores. Uh, you may have mentioned this, and I may have missed it. Is it. Do you have age limitations for students? No. None at all? No. And we do have uh, probably about, 15, 20% of our population are veteran, and that's going to vary in age as well, because there are um, veterans that have had career and then they want to come back and, and do something different at some point in their lives, but we do not have an age um, limitation. You have to be of age. You know, you, you could still be 17 if you're an early high school graduate and you have some parental sign off, but you, you know, we. You can't be younger than that. <laughs> Thank you. Additional comments? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Kusa. Thanks, Tess. Um, thanks for being part of the solution, as my friend Rocky would say. Um, and I can confirm from a, as an employer standpoint that UTI graduates are sought after for all the reasons you stated. Um, cursive is back. The government signed a bill, so we'll be teaching cursive in school again. <laughs> <laughs> I can throw away the workbook. <laughs> right. <at home. laughs> um, so uh, number of graduate or not, I should say, you know, well, number of, of students that attend um, percentage wise, if, you know, approximately how many end up in the industry or you know, rather than going, you know, like Bud said, somewhere else. So retention rates nationwide, about 70%. So okay. seven out of 10 are going to graduate nationwide. Sacramento has a, we perform at a little bit of a higher rate. And from a employment side, you know, depending on the program, you know, in the past, we've kind of used the number four out of five. So if you just roughly say seven out of 10, and then, you know, you're going to have 
eighty percent of those. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, in general, I'm happy to report this year in our auto, we were three verifications away from ninety percent. We led the organization this past year. Excellent. So, yeah. and do you do you track the students that become in the automotive industry and get jobs? Do they stick in the industry? Do they say, "Forget this, I'm going somewhere else"? And do you have any feeling for that? We don't track. Once we verify, you know, we certainly. Um, have opportunities for them to either come back and refresh, but we don't continue to track them. They have lifetime um, employment opportunity. They can come anytime in their lifetime to get help from us towards getting, but we don't track them. Um, the verification process, as you can well imagine, is more stringent here in our fine state of California. We do have the California verifications. So a graduate can't just be working at a dealership and if they're a porter it count that will not count because they're not working it, that percentage in what they studied so it's um quite a quite a stringent process to be able to count it, it would be it, you know, and you are probably you know the best equipped to do it uh, as well as you know some of our community college programs it'd be interesting to know if you could right um you know how many you know five years from Five years after graduation, getting a job, how many of your students are still in the industry? Right. Um, I suspect it, it's lower than we would hope, but it'd be nice to know because then maybe we could do something about it. Agreed. Yeah, yeah that Thank is a good you. data point. Yeah. yeah. Go, go, just go down the line, David Robinette. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, so talking about the output on the pipeline, which this is a wonderful pipeline you have built there with that community and with the students you have, the programs, very, very impressive, especially on the mentoring and the coaching portions of it, supporting them in whatever their needs are, even that of temporal, whatever their need is there too. Uh, my question is also, um, how many are staying in the industry? How many are we able to reach? You mentioned you had a team that is visiting schools and making presentations to try to get that word out. Is, is that the focus of your recruitment process? Uh, in and of itself, or do you have other ways that's happening? How are you attracting students into your program? So we do have the on ground folks would be the high school team, which is our field team. And we even have representatives in Hawaii. So it's it's everywhere um, across the, the nation. Then the um, adult population, they're based at the campus. So they're they're essentially working with leads that get generated from all of our advertising, you know, I, I joked with our marketing department years ago when I was educated, when I was like, I, you know, gosh, I'm not, you talk about this Pandora and these other areas. I'm not, I'm on those things. I don't get the, the advertisement. And they're like, Hun, you're not, you're not our demographic. <laughs> so, so it's, they do a lot of things through this, you know, eggshell and heat maps and it's quite an advanced understanding of YouTube and really a lot of things that are done online. Um, so there's that, you know, grassroots getting into all the high schools and then there's bigger is going to be all the online division and so forth. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I think is an interesting aspect about drawing new talent into the industries out there is just the awareness and how do you reach them? Find them where they are and hold their attention. Yeah. In between, you know, videos. Yeah. <laughs> in whatever way they can. <laughs> so that's why I was asking is if you'd had a. Um, uh, do you find that the recruitment process brings in more candidates than you are able to handle in the programming that you have? Bring them, and we will figure it out because I can always run more sessions. <laughs> yeah, I, I know there's I know there's a qualification process and a washout and that sort of thing. And that's natural. That happens. But I'm just curious as if. If the incoming flux of potential is that um, uh, large enough that it fills your classrooms nicely. Yes, but I can fill more. There's so. room for growth. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ruben Para. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a, a few technical questions to ask, and I'll refer most of them to um, yourself at a, at a different time. Just real quick on, on the... Uh, on the training, um, th the three week programs, for example, you said uh, breaks was three weeks, um, three weeks long. And I assume like most of the ASE areas, eight of the areas are three weeks long as well. For example, uh, engine repair, or transmission, et cetera. Uh, those follow the, the, uh, the three week model, is that correct? Yeah, good question, Ruben, thank you. It's, 
So the program, say, for example, automotive itself is 52 weeks in length, and it's made up of 18 three week segments. Okay. So brakes would be 1 example under car was 1 example that I used on electrical advanced electrical EV. So it breaks up. The program is broken up into 3 week courses dedicated in a specific area. Are they strictly ASE um, models of the ASE certification areas? We are part of ASC Education Foundation. We actually just went through our renewal a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay, very yep. good. Um, the other thing, uh, not, I have a couple of comments, um, one for um, Mr. Rice. So you might um, look into how many actual graduates and, and, and uh, you know, employees, junior colleges put out because it's not a small amount. It's quite a large amount, and I can get you those numbers if you like. Uh, but, and the other one is for uh, Dave. Um, so the junior colleges are held to uh, the chancellor's office, um, um, and and what they look like, they look at uh, success rates, they look at placement rates, but they also look at success rates after two and even five years. So junior colleges are held to that level, and if you want to, you want those numbers. For junior colleges, anyways, you can just simply look at the chancellor's office, the state office, and and get those. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Additional comments from the remote attendees of the buyer, the bar advisory group. Uh, any public comment? Yes, Jean Lopez, please come forward. Introduce yourself. Wherever you choose, <laughs> just make sure the mic is uh, lit on the bottom, the green button. I think you have to, I think you have to hit it on the bottom. Little button on the other side. There it is. There you go. Yeah. There I go. Hi, I'm Gene Lopez from Seidner's Collision Center in Southern California. We have 13 locations and 232 employees. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was formerly with um, ICAR, and while I was uh, with ICAR, I was on your campus when, here in Sacramento, when you had the um, collision repair um, courses being offered. And I'm still in on the advisory um, in Long Beach. Um, and so my question is, well, first let me make a comment. Um, for some 28 years, the former ICAR Education Foundation now the Collision Repair Education Foundation, since 1995, has had a survey every three years um, with collision repair owners and managers. And in that survey, um, they've always had a list of tasks that collision repair owners and managers expected from an entry-level technician. And this list was, it, 20 long, and it still is 20 long, but the top five have remained consistent for the last 28 years. And those skills are remove and replace a bolted on part, fix a small dent, prep a car for paint, detail a vehicle, and plastic repair. Now in the top five, they've, they've shifted a little bit. I, I think most recently, prep a car for paint went to number one. Be that as it may, um, these five skill sets are expected with little or no supervision, which means if we have a technician who has completed through a school like UTI and can perform those top five skill sets with little or no supervision, I could go and have this entry level technician with a list of five different vehicles for that day. You're, you're going to remove and replace um parts on these three cars you're going to prep these two cars for paint and you're going to detail these five cars to, for delivery this afternoon and that's all i have to tell him right show him the cars he has a, a, a labor worksheet he knows what needs to or she needs to be disassembled or reassembled and so on asc in last month no excuse me in august um created a task list, a list of 100 tasks for those entry level technicians. My question is, will UTI embrace that new list and offer an entry level 
program for collision technicians? So I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer your right. question, but I can comment on it, um, you know, unofficially. I would say that in the example I was using, just clarifying with Ruben, where our program length, whether it be collision or auto, anytime you have three weeks and they have exposure to something, oh, yeah. it takes a village. So if you're hiring a UTI graduate, they may have had breaks, you know, 40 weeks ago, they're not going to be able to just jump in and do that without any supervision. So we don't profess to be bringing out master technicians, their entry level. So I think any UTI graduate is going to have the skill, the exposure, and the, um, the demonstrated professionalism for the most part, right? You're going to still have human beings, but it does take a village with our employer partners. So I can speak in generality. Um, I do know that the, you know, we're very closely tied in, as I was stating to Ruben also, to ASE, mm -hmm. Education Foundation. So Collision is not at the Sacramento campus any right. longer, right. as you know. So I can't speak specifically to that, but um, I would imagine we're going to continue to be very closely tied. Yeah. So, yeah. so this would be a complete, as they say, paradigm shift, right? You are, you are, you are, excuse this expression, you are currently teaching that provides mile wide information that's only an inch deep three weeks of welding yep. does not create a collision technician who can perform welds but if you took those five skill sets and this needs to go to everyone at uti and their collision campuses if you could shift your your curriculum to offer those five skill sets and focus on those five skill sets where one skill set, remove and replace a bolted on part, is not three weeks long, but seven or eight weeks long. And final detailing a vehicle isn't three weeks long, but one week long, right? And so um, I, today, if I had that entry level technician who could perform those five skill sets with little or no, tech, uh, with little or no supervision, is worth at least $52,000 a year to me in salary. Take that to the bank. I would encourage you to, you said you participate in the program advisory yeah. committee. Yeah. Keep providing that feedback because yeah. the the you know folks that you're mentioning that would make those decisions, that feedback is valued yeah. and listened to. So that's how those those PAC members um that feedback is collaborated and looked at as UTI considers what types of curriculum changes to make for the future. But right. uh, keep doing that. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. And thank you for the time. Thank you, Gene. Um, any other public comments here in the room? Moderator, could you open it up for public comment on this specific agenda item only, please? Okay. Sorry, I, I looked up and- I tried, folks. I know. I'm sorry, but uh, also, um, um, John Gallo, Johan, you did so much and, and, and you've been appreciated and it was all before you were gray. So thank, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Moderator, please open it up for public comment on this agenda item. This is the moderator and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q and a feature for public comment members of the public. If you would like to make a comment for agenda item 3, please click the Q and a icon locate at the bottom right hand corner of your Webex screen or use the raise hand icon. And audio only participants can raise their hand by pressing star 3 on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, you may. And we have one additional comment from an advisory group member, uh, Bud Rice. Hi, uh, Bud Rice here. Uh, just, just real quick, um, Tess, I think, you know, we, uh, Gene was talking about his top five, okay? I'm, I'm going to tell you my top five, and I think if you can get my top five, you can give him his top five, okay? And what this about is mine? What, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> 
So this, this is the, I think this is what it takes as a starting point. Okay. Someone's got to show up every day. They got to show up every day. They got to pay attention. They have to have a willingness to learn. They have to do good work and be nice. If they can do that, you can give him what he wants through your training. Some right. of our best to that point, but best career readiness lessons that can occur on that campus are those items, having those skills and then exposure to the curriculum. You can't train those. So if we, as we work and guide and coach and mentor, gosh, if a student has that, the rest the rest is can and will come. So you're you're spot on. <laughs> All right. Oh, Mr. Robinette. I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Uh, Gene, thank you. Uh, good comments about the top five. It's interesting that you should mention those because I just had a conversation before the meeting began with Mr. Para about those very items. Uh, ICAR has built curriculum around that with that exact same idea in mind is an effort to try to get people up and running to a comp. Uh, we're, we're working for a competency on day one to be able to do just as Mr. Lopez is asking. And so that's in in the works. Uh, did, didn't interject that in your comments there because I know you didn't have a program there. Might I suggest that you add one? <laughs> Perhaps. Back to That's right. Bring it on back to Sacramento. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll pass along those comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That'll do it. Great presentation. Thank you, Tess, for doing this today. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Our next presenter on the agenda is Nathan Ryan, did I get it right? I did. Okay. With the Car Care Council, uh, his presentation is on the Cool Air Rebate Program. Thank you for being here. Uh, Chief DeRay and, and members of the advisory group, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here and to talk about uh, the program that we are launching here in California, the Cool Air Rebate Program. Uh, good to be with you today. My name is Nathan Perrine. I'm the Executive Director of the Car Care Council. Uh, the Car Care Council is a nonprofit organization uh, whose mission it is uh, to uh, do research in uh, the automotive space and to educate uh, the motoring public on the benefits of a well-maintained uh, vehicle. Uh, the, the council uh, has administered a program here in California for a number of years. Uh, and we are launching the cool air rebate program. Okay, so you can, uh, Zach, uh, move along to the next one here. Let's, uh, uh, no problem, I'll, I'll direct you. Uh, uh, the cool air rebate program. So uh, this is a, a financial assistance uh, program. It is a financial subsidy for low income motorists in California who need uh, repair work done on their vehicle air conditioning systems. Uh, and uh, the, there, there is a, a component of participation uh, uh, eligibility uh, on the consumer, and then there's participation uh, from shops. Uh, and uh, shops have an incentive to participate, I think, uh, by uh, capturing repair jobs that would otherwise go undone. And, um, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, recruit as many shops as we can. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the program is funded through the accumulation of unclaimed deposits. Uh, you may uh, uh, be aware of the requirement in California uh, for cans of small cans of R134A refrigerant. If you go to a, a Walmart or an AutoZone or, or an O'Reilly and you buy one off the shelf, there's a $10 core charge or deposit that you pay, which you can get back uh, if you return that can to the store uh, with the receipt uh, within 90 days of that purchase. Uh, you can get that back. Uh, a lot of the times that doesn't happen. In fact, about uh, one third of the time, uh, those deposits go unclaimed uh, by the consumers who originally paid them. The accumulation of those unclaimed deposits is what's funding this particular program. Uh, we have uh, $4 million earmarked for subsidies uh, in our initial uh, round, and uh, we're, we're, we're trying to distribute that and, and get that money back uh, to the industry and back to the consumers. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so ease of participation. So from a shop side, uh, there's, there's an application process. We're trying to make this as frictionless as possible, uh, for, for all parties. 
Uh, there is an application requirement. Uh, you do have to certify uh, to the council that uh, you have a technician that is 609 certified. If you're doing air conditioning work, you probably uh, already do, uh, but that is, that is a requirement. Uh, you tell us how you would like to get paid. Uh, if you uh, want a credit card, if you want to wait for a check, or if you, you want an electronic deposit, whatever, uh, we can't do a, really can't do an envelope of cash, uh, but uh, any, any other payments we can do. Uh, you have to um, submit uh, the, the diagnosis report to us so that we can verify that the repairs are eligible. What is an eligible repair? An eligible repair is a repair that addresses a leaking or an open air conditioning system. Uh, the goal of the project is to restore system performance. So as long as there's a leak somewhere in an O-ring or a component or, or, or a seal or hose, uh, those repairs would be eligible. Uh, I'm sorry, Zach, uh, back, back one more, please. Um, and and uh, once those uh, repairs are completed, then uh, the shop will get paid. Uh, if you're the consumer, uh, there is an eligibility that you have to, an eligibility requirement that you have to meet. If you are under 200% of the federal poverty line, uh, then you qualify for participation. Uh, if it, there, there are some automatic qualifiers that we've built in to try to reduce some friction if, if you participate in CalFresh or, or uh, reduced insurance or some other uh, low income programs, those are automatic qualifiers for this program. So. Uh, if you do qualify as a consumer, you will get a letter that you could take to any participating shop and uh, have that work done. Uh, the, uh, the, the payout or the, the maximum subsidy per vehicle in this program is $1,500. Uh, so there is a 20% copay or a 20% uh, responsibility on the consumer to pay uh, for 20% of the repair cost up to uh, 1,875. Uh, anything above that amount, the program would not pay. Uh, so there is a 2080 um, cost sharing between the program and the consumer. Uh, the diagnostic fee is covered by the program. That's outside of that $1,500. Uh, if the repairs are eligible repairs and if the consumer accepts those repairs, uh, there uh, may be times when uh, the repairs are eligible but the consumer does not accept those repairs or uh, the diagnos diagnosis indicates that there's not a leak, uh, there's uh, perhaps a bad component somewhere, uh, those would be ineligible. Uh, in that case, the program would pay 80% of the diagnostic fee, the consumer would pay the remaining 20%. Uh, next slide. So uh, as a shop, uh, wh why participate? Uh, well, the, the clear answer is that there are repair jobs that are going undone because consumers can't afford uh, to pay for the repair. Uh, so uh, you can take advantage of some of this earmarked money uh, by, uh, by participating in this program and uh, being able to perform some of those repairs uh, that, would, that would otherwise go uncaptured. Uh, you can build some trust in the community by taking part in this goodwill program and expand your customer base and it's, it's uh, positive uh, publicity. Uh, next slide. How do you apply? There is a, the program has a website, uh, shop.coolairrebate.org is the shop portion of that or the, uh, uh, the repair shop portion. Uh, that would be the place to go to apply. Uh, and again, trying to make this as frictionless as possible while still controlling for uh, potential fraud. We don't want the program to be defrauded, uh, but uh, we don't want to make it so hard that nobody participates. Uh, so uh, specify or, or certify that you have a, a 609 certified technician. Uh, tell us how you want to get paid and uh, give us a contact number that we can, uh, or a contact individual uh, that we can work with uh, to uh, answer any questions. Uh, about that. And there is a, a program uh, release of liability that, that really is uh, just to say that if there is a dispute between the consumer and uh, the shop as, as far as the work that is being done or the work that was done and maybe the, the cons consumer is not satisfied with what was done, uh, that's between the shop and the customer, uh, not between the shop and the car care council. Uh, we're just the, the funding mechanism here. Uh, so uh, that, that's all that release of liability is. Don't, don't sue us. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, how, how does it work? The consumer 
uh, connects with you, there's a consumer portal on the, on the program website. Uh, we'll have a map there of all the participating shops so the consumer knows where to go. Uh, to um, uh, to get their work done. Once they've uh, qualified and gotten their letter, they'll have uh, a place to go. Uh, so uh, uh, another benefit of participating in the program is uh, you would be listed on that website and, and would be a destination uh, for uh, people in your community. Uh, next slide. Uh, so perform the diagnostic. Uh, so submit the diagnostic uh, to the Car Care Council so that we can verify uh, that uh, the, the repairs are eligible. Uh, next slide, uh, perform the repairs and, and then uh, send, the, send the invoice to the program. Uh, next slide. And then get paid, um, wh whether that's a, a credit card number, a, a check, uh, an ACH. Um, haven't really contemplated a crypto payment, but uh, anyway, we'll pay uh, however you want to get paid. Uh, we've got we've got two weeks uh, as far as a, a lag time, and hopefully it's shorter than that. We we want that to be as small as possible. That uh, gap between the repair and the payment, uh, we do have a have to verify that the work was done and and that the repairs are eligible. And depending on the volume on any given day, uh, that may determine uh, how long it takes to get paid. But we want that to be as small as possible. Next slide. And, and that is it. Uh, we, are, we are launching the program in the Fresno area uh, to start. That is our initial target region. And uh, we have, uh, again, $4 million earmarked uh, during this first year. And uh, depending on how that works, uh, we, we would love to expand that program to the rest of the state. Um, any questions? We do sitting right next to me, Mr. Cusa. Thanks, Nate. Nice, nice to see you in person. Can yeah. I get paid in Apple gift cards so I could pay my IRS bill that the guy called me about last week? Uh, I'm sure we can work that out. <laughs> so um, uh, I, don't, I, I might have misunderstood. So if a, because uh, obviously, you know, my AC doesn't work, the consumer doesn't necessarily know what's wrong. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it turns out it's not, not a covered repair, uh, did I understand the 80% of the diagnostic charge would be covered anyway? Anyway, okay. by the program. And, and is there a cap on that diagnostic charge? There is not. Okay. And then um, I know we talked about this uh, on our uh, last meeting, but um, how long do you anticipate from me having the car, diagnosing the car, telling you what's wrong with the car to get approval to make the repair? And then how long do you think re, uh, getting paid would take? Uh, yeah. So uh, unless, unless the diagnosis results in something that's strange, uh, then th that approval of uh, eligibility approval would be pretty quick. It depends on volume. I mean, someone's got to look at it. Mm -hmm. If we have 100 of them in a day, it might take a few days to get through all those. Uh, but we anticipate uh, a, a day, uh, two days to let you know that that's an eligible uh, approved repair. Uh, and again, same thing on the payment. It's a question of volume. If we've got 100 of them on one day, uh, they're probably not going to get all done that day. Uh, but it, I, we but say day, two, day, two weeks. Yeah, yeah, days rather than months or weeks. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that, that's a, we're sensitive to that, mm -hmm. that you've done the work and, and need to get paid. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions as well. Um, I didn't see it. How long is the program going to be around for? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it, th there is, uh, so the initial funding is $4 million, uh, and there is more where that came from. Okay. So uh, if this program is successful and people take advantage of this and there's uh, you know, our, our initial uh, research has uh, uh, resulted in some, some uh, uh, we, we've concluded that there's a lot of demand uh, for this in the consumer uh, community for this. Uh, if this is successful, uh, then there is the opportunity to renew this program that we have to coordinate with the Air Resources Board uh, for okay. that. Uh, there's a uh, th there's an approval that has to be there, but we would love to continue this uh, as long as there's funding. Okay. We certainly want to help you promoting it. That's one of the reasons why we uh, were in agreement with you coming today to the advisory group. Uh, we just issued our fall newsletter, but our spring one, I hope that's still timely for you to be able to consider doing a piece in that article, in that newsletter. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, it'll be getting warm. Great. Yes, Jeff Cox.
uh, Jeff Cox, Automotive Maintenance Repair Association. H how do the shops provide this information to you? Are they scanning it, emailing you? How do they? How does that process work? Uh, electronically. Uh, so an email would be great. Um, I'm trying to think if we've got a mechanism through the portal itself to submit that, uh, we, which we probably do, and I, I don't know the technical uh, answer to that. Uh, but there is, uh, it'll be an electronic submission for sure. And then maybe a, a solution. It, so on our consumer facing website, we get about 30,000 consumers a month coming on our, on our site, looking for uh, what we call trusted shops. Mm -hmm. um, once you get a list of participating shops, we may be able to put an icon uh, next to their shop uh -huh. uh, on, on our page to, to help drive those consumers to know, oh yeah, not only is this a trusted shop because he's the MAP program, but they're also on the car program. So maybe we could chat about that as well. Love that idea. Yeah. Additional comments, questions? Oh, Tess, I'm sorry. So just a question. I saw that the way you're going to get that out to consumers is through social media and so forth. And uh, the launch is the Fresno market. Do you have samples of what that advertisement or flyer would look like and how you're communicating it to the consumers that maybe we could get separately? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we've, uh, we have some collateral in both English and Spanish uh, for that market, uh, the consumer facing collateral. We can ha uh, happy to share that. Okay. No, that'd be great. I just sometimes the better that communication can be, because there's caveats and dynamic and, Sometimes that can create a gap between their expectation and that could be an on ground shop experience that's not very pleasant if their thought was thinking it's one program and it's so I, it would be great to see that I'm sure you guys have thought through what that would need to look like and that seems like um, probably a, a challenge to overcome both from the shop understanding and the consumer. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. I'd love to yeah. see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments from the Bar Advisory Group members who are attending remotely? Let's, op let's open it up for public comment. Any com comment from those in, attending, in attendance in the room here? Seeing none, we'll ask the moderator to open it up for public comment via WebEx. This is the moderator and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and see none. Would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Yes, thank you. All right, any final comments? Yes, Bud Rice. Just, just real quick. Um, uh, so, how the program initiates is it can happen from the consumer side. They hear about your program through marketing efforts. Then they find a repair shop that has joined the program. Then they can come to us and then we figure out how we can help service them, right? That's the idea. Uh, okay. Is there any possibility of the shop side being the one that initiates it where they know this program is available and then they join a consumer in the, uh, in the engagement process from the shop side initiates it? Uh, even better, uh, if, if shops even have a collateral uh, in, in their, uh, at their facilities or if, if they have an air conditioning repair job uh, that they're working on and they can make the consumer maybe aware of that. Uh, that fantastic. Yep. Good question. Yeah, Jeff. Sorry, but that sparked another question. How, so for a consumer, so if the, if a shop starts the conversation and now the consumer needs to get approved to be on the program, how, can they do that quickly where it could be seamless and happen right there, right at the counter? Um, 
we'll have to think about that. Uh, there's uh, the application process is online. It's just a series of certifications uh, that there's no uh, human approval uh, okay. on our part. It's just, do you meet these criteria It's self-certification? So, so if they had a tablet or if they had something, they could direct a consumer, hey, fill this out and they could become approved right there. Yeah, and, and get a letter. And get a letter. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect, thanks. All right, Nathan, I think that does it. Thank you for the presentation today. Thank you, appreciate your time, everyone. Yes. All right, now we're going in-house for a couple of presentations. Our next presenter is Matthew Gibson from the Executive Office at BAR on the latest update on our efforts to get a vehicle safety systems inspection program implemented pursuant to AB 471, which you will tell us all about. Thank you and good morning. Just there's a button on the side there. Right there, right? Oh, I'm on. There we go. There you go. Thank you, Pat. This is the sixth tra uh, skill set that we have to. Uh, <laughs> there's five plus one more we're adding today. So as Pat mentioned, I'm Matthew Gibson. I'm a program manager in BAR's executive field office, and I'm here to give an update on where BAR is at in the implementation of the vehicle safety system inspection program. Just to give a, oh, you jumped ahead. Oh, that's all right. Just to give an update, or I should say a recap of how we got here. Assembly Bill 471, which was signed by Governor Newsom in September of 2021, created a vehicle safety systems inspection and certification program that will combine and ultimately replace our existing brake and lamp inspection programs, will allow us to include other safety systems as part of that inspection program and move BAR from a paper certificate to a, an electronic certificate for those inspections. So can I get the next slide, Zach? Thank you. So I wanted to cover, and it's kind of a recap because I imagine I covered this also in prior presentations on vehicle safety systems inspection program, but I wanted to cover or, recover, or cover again the, what we considered in implementing the new program and also the goals we have for the new program. So in implementing, the new program, the Bureau has the following goals, or had considered the following goals. The next slide. We considered the financial. I didn't mean for you to jump ahead, dude. <laughs> All right, sorry. All right, so the first consideration was the fin financial impact for the initial implementation. So uh, despite what our website says, there's approximately 800 lamp and brake brake stations in the state of California. The brake license, the lamp license are individual licenses, so they get counted twice. Of those 800 lamp and brake stations, a little over 650 of them are also smog check stations. And recognizing that our brake and lamp stations are the future population of, or the, are the likely future population of vehicle safety system inspection stations, we wanted to make it as easy and financially feasible for them to transition into the new program. Uh, with that in mind, we wanted to keep the initial implementation cost down while making sure that they had the equipment necessary to achieve the goals we have for the program. So the vehicle safety system inspection itself may cost consumers a little more than a lamp and brake inspection. Uh, there's obviously going to be more vehicle safety systems that are being inspected. Some stations will have to purchase additional equipment in order to perform the inspection, and BAR does not set the inspection price. But having said that, we hope in establishing the inspection standards and criteria that we will have limited the increase to something that is reasonable. We also uh, considered creating a phased in approach that will allow additional safety systems to be added easily in the future. And we considered how best to use existing systems and infrastructure for the new program. And I'm obviously referring to the BAR OIS and the vehicle information database. Can I get the next slide, Zach? Thank you. So, in implementing the new program, the Bureau has the following goals. We want to address uh, concerns regarding inspections performed under our current lamp and brake inspection programs. So, during or in our lamp and brake inspection program, the only verification that the license adjuster is the one who performed the inspection and certified the vehicle is the signature on a paper certificate of compliance. 
we wanted a way to verify that the technician who, whose license was used to issue the certificate of compliance was at the very least at the station and is personally certifying that the vehicle met the inspection uh, standards and criteria. In our current lamp and brake uh, inspection program, the only verification that we have that the vehicle was at the, the vehicle that was certified was at the station is that is that in handwritten information that's on the paper certificate of compliance and maybe the station's paperwork. But we wanted a way as much as possible to verify that the vehicle was there uh, at the station. On the certificate of compliance, from an enforcement perspective, there's a, uh, a glaring omission. Uh, the date of issuance is recorded on the uh, certificate of compliance by the technician, but not the time that the, the uh, inspection was actually completed, which creates um, infinite complications from an enforcement perspective. But uh, we wanted a certificate of compliance that had to be issued by the licensed technician with the date and time that the inspection was completed. And we wanted to create an inspection program that could be performed by our existing lamp and brake adjusters, but also include uh, additional obvious other obvious additional safety systems. And those could be expanded to be included in the program in the future. Okay, Zach, can I get the next slide? So stations are required to have the vehicle safety inspection system, which we actually refer to as being BAR SIS or BAR SIS. And that would include the, a computer with the currently supported version of Microsoft Windows, a barcode scanner or a printer, the BAR certified data acquisition device or DAD, a biometric device, a web, web camera in future implementation, as well as an internet connection. And all of those should sound familiar because that is essentially our BAR OIS analyzer requirements. Can you get the next slide, Zach? Other requirements. Uh, are similar to existing requirements for lamp and brake adjusting stations. And prior to lic licensure, applicants will be subject to an initial inspection by BAR field staff to verify they possess the required equipment and employ a licensed safety system technician. So a smog check test and repair station that is also a lamp and brake station should already have all of the required equipment to become a vehicle safety system station. A lamp and brake station that is not a smog check station will have to get a bar OAS, what is now a bar OAS in order to become a vehicle safety system uh, station. Test only smog check stations will not be able to become a vehicle safety system inspection station because the legislation requires that a safety sta system station is able to perform repairs to safety systems. So if there was a test only station that wanted to become a vehicle safety system station in the future, they would have to move to a test and repair license. Next slide, Zach. Thank you. So to obtain a vehicle safety system technician license, applicants must possess the ASC certifications for suspension and steering, brakes, electrical and electronic systems, and pass an initial licensing examination. And unlike our current lamp and brake adjuster licenses, which are valid for four years and require the licensee to retake the licensing exam to renew their license, the vehicle safety system technician license is valid for two years and will not require re-examination for renewal. Here, the next slide, Zach. Thank you. So for existing lamp and brake stations and adjusters, as currently drafted, the regulations would allow a current license, currently licensed lamp and brake adjusting station with licenses in good standing to forego the application fee to become a licensed vehicle safety system inspection station, and a currently licensed lamp and brake uh, adjuster with licenses in good standing to forego the application fee. The ASC certification requirement, however, those ASCs will be required upon renewal and they'll be allowed to forego the initial licensing examination. So this is, we're referring to this as our specialized licensing process for lamp and brake adjusters and stations. And in order, and as I mentioned, in order to take advantage of this process, uh, a station or an adjuster would have to have both a lamp and brake license uh, on the effective date of the regulations. Those licenses could not be on probation and they cannot be subject to disciplinary action because then they wouldn't be considered a good standing. An earlier version of the regulation text included a requirement that uh, both the lamp, uh, the station or the adjuster would have to have both those licenses for a period of 18 months prior to the effective date of the regulations. But after our last workshop in April, we moved away from that requirement. The requirement is that uh, the breaker lamp adjuster or station has both of those licenses and they're in good standing on the effective date of the program regulations. So 
there is an opportunity right now for any lamp technician who is not also a brake technician or a brake technician who is also not a lamp technician or station, same, same, that has one and not the other. They could go and get that other license prior to the effective date of our regulations, and they could take advantage of the specialized licensing process if they wanted to. Um, because after the effective date of the regulations, those uh, examinations will no longer be available specifically for the adjusters. And actually, the applications themselves will no longer be available to stations or adjusters. And, and I've gone through the list of things that are waived for the adjuster and the technician after the effective date through the specialized licensing process. So, take it to the next slide, Zach. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, the BAR safety inspection system or BAR SIS is, software is being deployed or has been deployed for a portion of this uh, to existing BAR OAS analyzers and three updates through 2023. The first release, which is 23.1, which covered the, the shared functionality between the OIS system and the new SIS system, was deployed in June of 2023. The second release, which is 23.2, and that covers the actual vehicle safety system uh, inspection process, has already been tested internally through our, you know, our user acceptance testing, and is set to, is projected to be deployed in early November of 2023. And the third release, which is 23.3, which covers the remaining and uh, implementation items is currently, well, actually this needs to be updated. It was accurate when I wrote it. We were supposed to be in user acceptance testing, but uh, that's been pushed until the end of October. And that uh, projected deployment for 23.3 is now into the middle of December. Uh, okay, take it to the next slide, Zach. So this is going to be the new main menu screen for those that Get in, go on the bar OAS or the bar SIS. Uh, it's going to be changing from two rows of four tiles to three rows by three tiles. You will see that the vehicle safety system inspection, or referred to as VSS inspection, has been added to the ninth tile at the bottom part of the right hand corner. Uh, also, that is going to be seen by people that are logging into the bar OAS after the deployment of the 23.2 release. But that option, number nine option for the vehicle safety system inspection is not gonna be, uh, it's gonna be grayed out. It won't be able to be selected until we actually implement the program. You might also notice, or those that are familiar with the screen would notice that on top of it, the header says CalViz instead of bar OAS. That change is gonna happen at the 23.3 release, not at the 23.2. So uh, those that log in again to um, bar OAS would be recognizing that after the 23.3 release in the middle of December, uh, the header on it is going to change to vet calviz instead of bar OIS. Hit the next slide, Zach. So if you selected the VSS inspection option, you would be taken to this screen, which has all of the inspection systems, or all the modules for the systems that are being inspected. You notice the bottom one for road test is grayed out. The way that the inspection itself is uh, constructed, the way it's meant to work is that all the other Inspection items have to be performed before you can select the ability to do the road test, meaning that you've selected brakes and either it's passed or it's failed, and you've inputted the information that's asked of you by the system, and you move through all of those existing modules that are on the screen. And after you've completed those, you can choose to road, you can, you can road test the vehicle. That, that option will be available to you as a technician. Hit the next slide, Zach. All right. So information on implementation. So uh, we just put out an article in our fall 2023 auto repair smog check newsletter. It covers some of the information I just, well, it covers most of the information I just provided, but specific to how technicians uh, can take advantage of the specialized licensing process and also notifying those that may not have both licenses that they have an opportunity to get the other license and take advantage of the specialized licensing process if they choose to. We will have information on our website, our public website on the implementation so that you can have information uh, available to you when you go on our website and where we're at in the implementation process. But if you wanted that information actually sent to you directly, you can always join our email list and our quick links section so that that information is sent to you by email, even so that you don't have to just go to our website uh, to try to find it whenever you are looking for it. It would be forced, forced to you or it'd be pushed to you. So, um, one other thing I was considering, it's not on the slide, but there is an interest that we have in trying to get information out about the program, specifically for those that uh, are brake or LAMP certified, but not both. 
And I was hoping that obviously you all represent industry groups and I would hope that uh, information could come from you to your shops that you represent about the opportunity that they have to uh, take advantage of the specialized licensing process or that they have an opportunity to get the missing license in order to take advantage of the specialized licensing process. I will tell you the last time we ran data on this, I think we're only looking at about like 170 technicians in the state have one but not the other. And I guess that's who I'm targeting. And although that seems like a small number, when I only have 800 stations, you know, and, and I have about 800 technicians, it actually is kind of a bigger number. And so I'm trying to capture all of them that I can and bring them over to the new program so that we have an operational system when we implement it. And that's, next slide, Zach. That's my presentation. Thank you, Matt. We'll open it up for questions or comments. Go all the way to the end this time, Gary Conover. Uh, Gary Conover, CAWA. Hi, Matt. Um, this is kind of a joint question for Pat and Matt, and maybe even uh, I think Kayla made the uh, presentation on the procedural matter here. So if if we can just review uh, when this program will be finally adopted and everything in between today and then. And that's on actually on page eight of the ledge report slide uh, 15. Yep, you want me to? I'll, I'll, to. I can get it. All right, so right now the regulations, the proposed regulations are at agency, meaning that they have already been reviewed by the director and by DCA legal and it was approved for forwarding to agency. Agency typically takes 30 days for their review process you know that they went over on October 19th, I thought it was the 25th, but either way, we should be hopefully hearing back from agency relatively soon before the end of the month. After we get approval from agency, then the regulations go over to OIL for the initiation of the 45 day comment period. When we're in the 45 day comment period, we're using this rule of thumb that we're about 90 days away from the adoption date of the regulations. And so the, in that 90 days, you would have the 45 day comment period you'd have some period of time after the 45-day uh, comment period to generate the final statement of reasons and any other finalized uh, final phase documents that have to be completed, resubmitting them through DCA and agency, getting them to uh, get approved for final submission into OAL, who has another 30 days to redo, uh, review those regulations for approval. So we're thinking that once we hit 45-day comment period, we're about 90 days away from adoption. That doesn't take into account if I have to go to a 45 day comment period as a result of, uh, I'm sorry, a second or a 15 day comment period as a result of any comments we receive in the 45 day comment period or any, uh, or a 15 day comment period as a result of any comments from OL. So I don't have a date. <laughs> you <could have> just... <laughs> yeah. Well, he asked for the process. I'm trying to be thorough. But... I would just say that when we hit the adoption date, we're thinking we're three months out. And we have talked internally about, depending on where we're at with other parts of the implementation, having the effective date very close to the ad ad adoption date. And that's kind of the strategy that we're working out right now. So the, the, the statute requires an adoption date, I believe, of January 1, 2024. So it doesn't appear we're going to make that. That is accurate. What, what are the concerns, are there penalties? Uh... I'll let you do it. What happens when you don't meet it? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, we obviously have done everything within our power. There are some processes uh, in place that are outside of our control. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the response is on something like that. Um, don't even know how to answer that one. Um, we're giving it our best to, to meet the January 1 adoption date. Still pushing. Thank you. Uh, and then you already covered that it's likely that effective date and implementation date could be down the road a bit. Um, adoption of the regulations is one thing, and a transition um, and the ability to uh, make sure that we're ready to go um, that will probably be somewhere around. I would say April it could be even closer to the second quarter of July. That's right. And when we originally talked about timeframes and we laid out the original schedule for this program, we had it hoped 
to actually have these regulations adopted by October 1st. Uh, and that would have allowed us a period of time to start getting people licensed. And then on January 1st, we could have implemented the program. Uh, as timeframes have compressed, uh, we are now in a position where we will have an adoption date and an effective date that are gonna be into January of 2024. And we will have to start licensing at that point. And I don't know that implementation is gonna come before we have stations that are licensed to do it. So there's gonna be a period of time where we're working vigorously to get people into the program. And then we will implement the program where the inspections can start being performed. Additional, I uh, guess, Bud Rice. Uh, Matt, just if, if just bear with me just for a second, okay? If I was to make my hands do this for just a second, okay, over here. Today, there is a break and lamp program that are done by those service providers, and they're over here, and they do that, okay? You're trying to get to where people that have smog equipment can also decide to do that work, or people that do this work over here get the equipment and can also do that because it will help enhance the testing regimen and what you're able to report and get move upstairs and downstairs. You'd be able to report that easier because you've got equipment on site that can help with that process, right? Okay. The, the name of the program is the safety system inspection. It's, it's, it's confusing to some degree to people that are in the industry because it means something a little bit different. So if I were to go back to my, my, my arms here, this is where we are today with break and lamp. You're trying to move them over here. But if I move my hand over here, we have unsafe vehicles that are on the roadway that shouldn't be on the roadway because they're unsafe to the motoring public because they've got bald tires, their lights don't work, they've got brakes that are ready to fail, all of that kind of stuff. And you would think if you were gonna have a system safety inspection program, you'd be looking for not just salvage vehicles that are trying to get back on the road again that can have their, their, light, their lamps and stuff checked over, but how do we handle these unsafe vehicles of which there are probably thousands on our roadway to make sure that the motoring public is safe? So somewhere, somewhere between here and here is all these cars that need to be uh, some kind of a comfort level that the vehicles that are on the roadway are safe. And so I, 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 I'm not sure where this fits into that, to that system, but I think if we're marching down that road and this is the best we can do at this time, I, I, I gotcha. But if the idea is we're gonna make this kind of a stopway on the effort of to do the best we can to get over to this side, now, now I can follow along with you pretty good. So I just wanted to explore that a little well, bit. Well, I think I've covered this before too, and I'll just reiterate, it's like, we create this program because we were required to. Also, we wanted to create this program because we think it will be better than what we have through our break and lamp inspection program. And as we create this program, the vehicle code says how it's used by DMV for registration purposes. And right now, the vehicle safety system inspection program as a result of uh, AB uh, 1263 is replacing all the requirements in the vehicle code for by the replacing lamp and brake requirements in the vehicle code with vehicle safety system inspection. So we literally are just, it's a replacement program. If there's an interest on the part of the, you guys, I guess, or but more like the California motoring public or our legislature, they can choose to expand the program in the future through legislation and they could make adjustments to the vehicle code, which then require DMV to accept it as part of a new or a renewal registration process if they so choose. But right now it's just, yeah, not the case. I don't know where the program goes. Uh, all I'm, I'm concerned about making sure that the program is going to be functional, right? And that it's, that it's substantive and it's better, substantive, subs anyway, that it's better than it was. Sorry. Anyway, uh, and that, uh, but uh, what happens next with that? I don't. I suspect we'll be uh, having to report it in our next sunset review. In 2027, the report will be published and then we'll go before the legislature again. Uh, questions and suggestions, ideas like this would be a great opportunity for that. I would think if you can wait four years, um, but um, 
I mean, there are opportunities sooner, but it is, it's, you know, the lift on some of these legislative efforts are pretty challenging. Um, and that's why the sunset review is such an excellent opportunity to be able to bring all the stakeholders together at one time to get a, a major change like that, like you're talking about, bud, done. But the, we got to, we got to get this first phase of the program that's required in, in law, uh, uh, limited to just salvage vehicles up and running first. I, I'll start, Mr. Cusa, go ahead first and then. Thank you, Matthew. Um, how many vehicles will be subject on an annual basis if we know to this program? Well, again, this is a replacement for break and lamp. I right. know how many break and well, lamps. Well, I mean, well, salvage, right? I mean, it, 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 yeah. I mean, because, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's strictly salvage vehicles coming back on the road, right? So I, I mean, we may not know. I don't know. But, you know, it, I, I, you know, obviously the number of salvage vehicles is the number that will be subject to the program. Okay. So I don't know how many break and lamp certs. I can't say how many break and lamp inspections are done on an annual basis, but I can tell you how many break and lamp certificates we sell on an annual basis. It's around 250,000. Okay. Yeah, but that's a fraction are probably salvage, right? I mean, some number of that are salvage, but not all. Uh, most of them are salvaged. Uh, there's the other requirement in the vehicle code for a, a brake inspection has to do with uh, private fleet ambulances okay. and private fleet emergency vehicles. Those require an inspection through a licensed brake, brake and lamp, lamp brake adjuster. Uh, so yeah, a majority of them are going to be okay. for salvage so vehicles. Somewhere so near 250,000 vehicles a year. We can expect since it's a replacement, yeah, yeah. it's just be right. exactly the same. Yeah. So, and we have 800 licensed shops that do that. So they do a lot of them. Um, some do more than others. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and you're hoping that either or will become both so that they can take advantage of the program. What if we don't get enough people to sign up for the program? And we can't implement it efficiently. That's why I'm working so hard right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Trying to make sure everybody knows we're going to, we're doing it. We're pinning it over backwards to get them licensed. Cause like, I, 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 250,000, I, I would have guessed, I would have guessed lower. So that's a lot. That's a lot of cars. Well, the shops are doing, I mean, if we, when we did the math, it's like, yeah. 12 and a half or 13 per station per month. I figured, yeah, yeah, all I can do is the best I can to get it. You know, no, no, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just like, you know, if, if half these shops say, I don't want to do it, is that enough shops to, to have the program be effective, right? I, cause I, obviously we want it to be effective. Yeah. I don't have an answer for okay. that one. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Some good questions and thinking, obviously, we'll be thinking about that once the regulations are adopted, we'll start accepting applications and we'll, we'll know at that time what the interest in the program is. Uh, Johan. Yeah, just uh, following up on Dave Cusa's question, you know, we, you're saying we have 800 shops right now. And the question is, how many of them are going to qualify for the new program? And what are we going to deal with if we don't have enough shops to deal with the volume? You're saying right now it's 250,000 vehicles that are going through some type of certification process. And just working on a recent project with Rocky Carlisle on electric vehicles as an example, because they're going to be in that fleet of salvage vehicles, I would imagine. Uh, if we were to look at L3 techs, we only have 487 certified in the state. L1, we're at 5,890. A1, we're at 9,907. And now all of a sudden, we're going to introduce this new program for the inspection program for salvage vehicles. The question is, what are you going to do to incentivize getting people into this program or to continue the program to even make it viable? Well, what I'm doing to incentivize them is a specialized licensing process. I mean, that I'm giving away the licenses for, well, we, I should say, our borrowers giving away the licenses for free. Essentially, they don't even have to pay an application fee as long as they're an existing brick and lamp uh, adjusting adjuster or station. Uh, of the 800, I believe almost all of them, I'd have to, we'd have to look to see who doesn't qualify, but as long as they have both licenses and they're not on probation or they're not subject to depending disciplinary action, they're going to be qualified for the specialized licensing process to transition to the no, new program. I will just, we'll be as close, we're going to, we'll do everything in our power to get as many qualified stations up and running prior to the implementation date so that when we implement it, we will have a program that will handle the volume of vehicles that require inspection. Yeah, I was just talking with Dave. Um, 
the 250,000, as you mentioned, is certificate books or sales, right? We, because it's a paper certificate, we don't know the number that are being issued as a result of an inspection. Um, we won't until we go electronic like with smog, and that's the plan for the new program. I, I just wonder up and before then, because I, I don't think it's 250,000. Um, I'd be surprised. Um, I wonder if stations are just stockpiling them, holding on to them, maybe for whatever reason, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if DMV would have that, they must know how many salvage title vehicles are registered each year. That would be... DMV or, would know. Yeah. Okay. Be nice to know if it's how far close, how close it is to 250,000. Yeah, and it's a round number. I know that I watched, I, I looked at our volume of certificate sales over a 10 year period and I'm averaging it out. Last year was like 230. But the point is that speaking around numbers, 250 is easier for us to think of. Sure. Conceptualize. Right. So that's why I went with that number. I got you. Additional questions, comments to, yes, Jack Maladonna. Yeah. Thanks, Matt, for the presentation. So we know just uh, the, this is focused on revived salvage vehicles. Um, there, you mentioned the nine modules for inspections, um, right? You have to go through, I guess, windshields, tires, um, airbags, right? Have, have you guys looked at, you know, how long, an estimate, how long that would take internally? Like how long do you think that the inspection process would take to do it correctly? Yeah, um, no, not really. No. So it could take an hour, it could take an hour and a half, it could take 30 minutes. I would say that a majority of the inspection items are a visual inspection, starting off with where we're at related to brake and lamp. The largest portion of the vehicle safety system inspection is going to be checking the brakes and checking the lights, in addition to doing a visual inspection of the vehicle structure, right? And you talked about, you mentioned a couple of the items from the, the passenger compartment inspection, which are also going to be visual inspections, as well as checking dashboard uh, warning lights. So I imagine it might take... A, Few more minutes than an existing lamp and brake inspection, but I don't know that's going to take a lot more. Okay. Well, there's a driving co co a component here. Do you have to test drive it for suspension or? Well, you test you, you test drive it for control, and but there is already just in brake inspection a requirement to test drive the vehicle to make sure that it stops within a certain distance at a certain speed, and that's built into the road test itself as well. One of the issues that had come up before is that if a consumer gets a ticket for a a lamp uh, or their, their light is out and they get a fix it ticket. Uh, they currently can go into a lamp uh, that's certified and get it signed off and checked, right? Now, if a consumer after this program gets implemented, um, when the consumer comes in, they're not gonna have to go through this nine, pro nine step process, right? Or they can just come in and just get their lights checked. They're not gonna have to go through and get everything checked, correct? That's exactly right. I know that right now, or so the vehicle code section that gives the authority of a lamp adjuster or a brake adjuster to inspect a vehicle to clear a fix a ticket or a, well, anyway, uh, it doesn't require a certificate actually be issued by that adjuster. It just requires, it gives them the authority to sign off on the ticket itself. And that vehicle code section is being modified through assembly bill 2012-63 to now be a vehicle safety system technician. Yeah. So in other words, a consumer is not going to, you're not going to get complaints saying, hey, I just wanted to get my, my you know, my ticket here cleared but you know the shop made me go through this exercise where i had to have everything inspected and charged me x amount so that's there'll be no requirement to put them through the full inspection in okay. order to sign up on a fix it ticket okay i don't know what complaints we'll get okay <laughs> all right well thank you very much thanks yes matt thank you matt um a couple questions i think we might have talked about these in the workshop seems like a lifetime ago so um one was so this inspection is a, it's a one-time inspection, right? So when the vehicle's first sold with a branded title in California, the, the inspections required, it's not ongoing, like if it changes ownership? Uh, no, so it's it's required prior to getting the branded title. You need to get the okay. inspection in order to get a salvage certificate okay. so, or a salvage title vehicle. So yeah, and it's only one time okay. for the vehicle. Yeah. And I think in the workshop we did talk about this, but I can't remember the answer. So if the vehicle fails, say two of the nine categories as far as the retesting goes is the entire inspection required or just the items that failed yeah i don't have a a, a partial inspection built in they okay. have to, so they, they go through the, the the full inspection yes 
And um, third question, if there is a, um, is there any, is, will there be any guidelines for um, repair facilities that maybe bring a vehicle in and there's like significant safety issues that, uh, I, you know, say that it fails everything and, uh, you know, where this car really shouldn't even be driving. <laughs> Uh, because I know that's a concern in other states on the, some of the programs, you know, someone would come in with these crazy things. It's like, man, you really shouldn't drive this. And then, you know, the, the, there was facilities that were concerned about liability, letting this car go back out on the road. Well, um, I mean, it was, but, well, it's not a lot different than general automotive repair. Uh, sure. I mean, like some recommended practices though, like, Hey, if you know, there's this, um, I, I don't you know. And maybe that's just for each repair facility to decide whether they have someone to you know give some you know have someone sign something that hey we're we're, we're not we're, we're recommending that you don't drive this vehicle so you know you're doing this at your own risk because you know the consumer the person bringing in might not have known of the potential you know there's maybe the brake system is you know almost close to failing or what have you so i will tell you that in the program we built in there so all the modules have to be completed that are appropriate for the vehicle but the only right. module that a technician can bypass is the road test for exactly that reason. Sure. So in the process of performing the inspection, they find that the vehicle literally shouldn't be driven. Yeah. They can opt not to do the road test. Of course, the vehicle will fail the inspection automatically. Sure. But uh, I built that in, so I'm not going to put those technicians in the position where they have to drive a car that they believe to be undrivable or unsafe. But again, I, I, whatever guidance we would provide to an ARD that has the same concerns would flow to a station that feels in, that they're finding themselves in the same position. They can't hold the car. So... But uh, they should, yeah, Re recording information they feel is pertinent on the invoice so that they disclose their findings to the consumer and the consumer can deal with it appropriately. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, as I understand this, right, the, the person that is restoring said salvage vehicle would be responsible for having this inspection done before it's sold to a consumer, ideally. Yes. So, so a lot of that is already taken care of in, in to, to Matt's question, but, um, and I know we talked about this a little in the past, right? Obviously, especially early on here, there's going to be a lot of ignorance of this regulation on both the, the seller and buyer side. So it's well within the realm of possibility that a perfectly honest person that's trying to sell a salvage vehicle doesn't know an unsuspecting consumer buys said vehicle, it fails inspection. What recourse would well, A, what is the shop's responsibility to inform the consumer of this, right? Don't buy this car. You don't have, it's, you don't have a piece of paper, right? You're coming in saying, I want a piece of paper, you, which you don't have. And B, if, you know, if it goes through that process and it fails, does the consumer have any uh, uh, recourse through BAR to go after the seller to get my money back? Well, not through BAR, but maybe through DMV. DMV, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh yeah, I don't know how to. Yeah, and 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 I guess the follow up to that would be, you know, are we doing anything uh, uh, to notify consumers and, quite frankly, salvage sellers that this is this is the deal now? We will have to. So right now we're on the <laughs> the transition for well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I far as yeah, uh, yeah public uh, <laughs> notification and information that it will be forthcoming as we yeah. get closer to the implementation date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional comments, questions? Yes, Ruben. Um, I got a couple of questions. So one, uh, by any chance, do you happen to have like the average price of the current brake and lamp inspection? Any, any average for the state at all? I, I don't know. I, I think it's like 120 bucks, but I, I really am for both. And maybe even with smog, I, but I really don't know. And I am guessing, okay. so no, I don't know. And then the other one is uh, you said for the uh, technician requirements, um, it, once they get their license and and pass the test, they uh, they renew it after two years, and uh, it's that's that's all. It's a simple uh, renewal, no examination, no update training, no kind of uh, anything else. Just yeah, their ASCs have to be current, right. but uh, short of that, it's just a straight up renewal. It, yeah, they don't have to be reexamined by us to to renew their licenses like they do for light break, and no kind of update training at all either. All right, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any of the bar advisory group members attending remotely have comments or questions?
Any public comment? We have one over here in the room. I will just say I moved over. I sat here so that you could sit there. But if you want to sit over there, it's okay. I'll try I not did, to be offended. I didn't know. I should have known. <laughs> Jim Todd with Opus Inspection. These might be a couple of questions off in the weeds, but a couple of concerns are the equipment related items. As BAR is transitioning technology to DAD 2.0, is this program fully compatible with the designs of DAD 2.0? So the program is, well, the way the regulations are structured and the requirements for a station is that they have the current version of DAD that is also being used by Smog Check. So when this program is rolled out early next year, uh, they will be required to have DAD 1.0 because 2.0 doesn't exist at this point yet. 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 But at the point that DAD 2.0 is out there and being used by smog check safety system stations will have to have it as well but i mean your software your oh. web-based software is prepared to make the transition yeah because it uses the same system as bar oas okay i just i like i said soften the weeds i just had to ask Fair enough. um more important though is you had alluded that there will be add-ons to the program in the future can you give us some speculation on what type of things such as aiming of cameras and such oh ADAS. Uh, so we had talked about ADAS. Actually, I'll just go through the ADAS spiel real quick. So we, everybody, I didn't cover it because nobody asked yet. But uh, so talking about advanced driver uh, assist system, assistance systems, uh, we have covered those and have been asked, I've asked many questions about it as we've been going through this process of developing the program. And one of the things we originally committed to was the idea that we would try to collect as much information about safety systems in the vehicle at the time we were doing the inspections. The idea being that we would gather whatever, when we're plugged into the OBD connector, we were hoping we could get into access to the control units that control the ADAS systems. And we would attempt to gather that information and do research to determine what it is that we could see from the data that we were being collected. Uh, ADAS is a problem from our perspective because there is no unifying uh, protocol for communication. Uh, manufacturers don't even call the same thing the same thing from one car to the other. And so it's not like OBD2 where we are in a really good place to check the car to see what the systems are saying. So the idea was we'll do research. So we'll plug into these cars and we'll see what we can gather from the control units and we'll see what we can see at the time we're doing the inspections. And then from there, we can make decisions about what we could do on ADAS systems. The idea was, I think initially, if we could do ADAS, what we really wanted was the ability to scan the ADAS systems, determine if anything, that they're all there. So whatever the vehicle was manufactured with needed to be present and that it was, there was no at least trouble codes independent of any like actual camera calibration or anything that, that in depth. I wanted, I thought that would be the best place to start. The problem was that we, could, we couldn't find a vendor that was able to give us that information on a VIN specific nature for each vehicle. So in order to know what the car was gonna be required to have, I needed to know what it had, right? So I need to know what systems it was actually uh, equipped with when it was manufactured and then compare that to the information that I was receiving from the vehicle when we were pulling it during the inspection. But as I can't tie those two together, it created a problem. So all we can do is look for somebody who can assist us in getting that information in the future. So that was one. I don't know of any other ones that we had specifically in mind, but people do suggest things at time. I think we really want to just get up and running with what we have as far as what's in the current version of the vehicle safety system inspection manual. And then from there, figure out what else would make sense or work. Covers it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Oh, Gene, I did it specifically because I thought Gene you were going to come up here. Between you and Pete, I thought I'm doing you guys a favor. You could be up here. It has a different mic setup than the other one, though, I must say. He's got it. I'll come up here. So, yeah, I was going to ask about ADAS. And, and, and as we know, ADAS, Advanced Vehicle Safety Systems, it's now becoming automated um, driver assist systems because they're not advanced anymore. And so we're going we're gonna to have some vehicles, and specifically electric vehicles, um, that you may not be able to have an onboard diagnostic port, right? Um, Tesla doesn't have an OBD2 port. Um, you have to go in via um, their own software on a laptop and plug it in 
um, to the vehicle itself. So when I saw your nine lists and then um, the final one before the, 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 the test drive was an OBD, OBD test of some sort. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to look at that from an, an electric vehicle um, standpoint. That was a great point. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so I, I think it's because ADAS isn't currently employed in this inspection. Um, I just, I just beg you that it should be. Um, we have, we just gifted a 2016 Mazda and this Mazda six was equipped with every ADAS system available at that time. Um, and so, and that was a, that was a salvage title vehicle. And so, um, fortunately for us, we have, um, diagnostic tools that can test for those trouble codes. Um, I would suggest that in the future, your new testing stations have the equipment. Um, and there's plenty of them. There's aftermarket and there's, there's OE um, um, uh, uh, scan tools that can provide information on diagnostic trouble codes. Um, and, and there's just, you know, a, a handful of aftermarket tools that are available that we should, you know, as a group, we should probably go investigate and and see what the available. I I think you could even go to Walmart and get an OBD two um, tester to to check for DTCs. Well, I mean, our, we currently get DTCs when we plug in. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Uh, moderator, could you open it up for public comment from for the for the WebEx? So moderator and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q and A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q and A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen, or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we do have one request um, from Gary Zaprazalka, and I hope your microphone is working this time, uh, Gary. Uh, I'll request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Gary, you are unmuted. Yes. Oh, and we can hear you. Great. Great. Uh, one of the questions I have is that some of them were already taken. Uh, how much can these uh, uh, licensed technicians farm out? And my regards are based upon, let's say it needs a body control module for the lighting and it needs to be programmed and they're not into programming. How much of this stuff can they actually farm out? So they can't farm out or sublet any of the actual inspection process, but they're not also, they're also not responsible for repairing the vehicle unless they choose to do the repair work themselves. So okay. fundamentally, 100 percent. All right, that, that's that was the main question that I had there. That'll do it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, this is the moderator. I have a request for comment from Rich Solover, and Rich, you'll be uh, well. There's no time limit. I apologize. Um, I'll request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, my question for you, Matt, is if I heard you correctly, once you enter into the uh, the process of the inspection, you have to complete all of the modules except the drive module. There's no way to suspend this inspection and then re-enter it at a later date after repairs of a certain module have been completed. So actually, you can uh, like pause an inspection just like you can for smog check and then there's a timeout feature that's built in that would you have to return to that inspection by in order to continue it uh, much like smog check. But if you're talking about during the, well, let me put it this way. This inspection is not prescriptive in the same way as smog check, meaning you could do large portions of this inspection prior to ever logging into the safety inspection system itself. 
So you could do the whole inspection, the actual procedures are in the manual, and then from there go into the system login and then start inputting information. If you find that there are failure items uh, and you feel like you wanted to perform those repairs and your customer was agreeable to performing those repairs, those actually could be re resolved prior to you even inputting the information into the analyzer. Again, unlike smog check, I'm not trying to calculate how many vehicles are failing versus you know when they're tested. I, I'm not trying to calculate emission reductions. So since it's a little bit different in that way, um, you, those are the two options. One is that large portions can, you can inspect the vehicle prior to getting into the system and, uh, and you also have a timeout feature. And we extended it, I think, out to 45 minutes for safety because we don't know how long it's gonna take to do the, the road test inspection. But there's one caveat to this whole thing that I will point out is that uh, there is an inspection to see uh, if the vehicle has any open recalls any open safety recalls. And if there are any open safety recalls, the vehicle's gonna fail the inspection. And that, in, that portion of the inspection is done without any input from the safety technician himself. So when you originally get the vehicle and you plug into, the, when you originally get into the system and input the vehicle information, that check is done almost automatically. Like it's the first thing that happens because if we're having a problem with uh, getting information back from our vendor who provides that information, uh, we wanted to notify the safety technician right away, or if the vehicle is going to fail, uh, they could know right away and make a decision on whether to proceed or not with the inspection. Uh, because there might be a safety recall that has to be repaired prior to uh, them actually, because they'll have to have a safety recall done before they're going to pass the inspection, independent of all the other uh, inspection modules. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Thank you. I was going to mention one other thing. Uh, it, it might not have been a complete answer about the idea that uh, it was about the farming out. I will say that uh, at Smog Check, obviously, if you want to have smog repairs, they have to be done by a licensed technician at a licensed station. Uh, there, a licensed vehicle safety system station has to perform, uh, has to have the ability to do repairs on safety systems, but the repair of safety systems is just automotive repair, and so we don't require that those repairs to fix a failure for a vehicle safety system uh, failure, like to, that those repairs to correct the failure are not required to be done by a licensed technician. I guess I wanted to say that. That's why you could not really farm it out, but anybody can do the repair work and bring it back. It's gonna to have to go through the whole inspection, which goes to your question about, uh, you're gonna to have to, I don't remember, I think it was, who asked about a partial inspection? Was it, anyway, uh, the, the reason we don't do a partial inspection is because the inspection is a point in time inspection. I don't know what period of time is gonna pass after the failure and when the vehicle goes back to the shop. And so I needed the technician to certify at that time that when they inspected that vehicle, it meets the inspection criteria and standards for each of those items without just coming back and hitting one or two and the status of one of those changed. And all of a sudden he is certifying a vehicle. Met all those modules uh, passed or met those, the inspection standard and criteria when in fact they did not. So that's the reason why there's no partial inspection. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments on the from the public? This is the moderator. Appears there are no further requests. Would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. You'll probably be back after the regulations are adopted. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. We are running behind, but um, we have a an agenda item that we still need to get through. We usually have scheduled these meetings till one and we thought this would be, we'd be able to get through this agenda. It was a shorter agenda, uh, but <laughs> longer presentations and a lot of good dialogue um, on the topics here, but I uh, wanted to make sure we get through our agenda. We do have that parenthetical or until close of business. So we'll get through this. This is a presentation that was asked for by Bud Rice from Bill Thomas with uh, our deputy uh, chief for smoke check, uh, or excuse me, field operations and enforcement division. Uh, this is an accusation case study. Uh, I think we, these were, we were calling these jokingly after the last bar advisory group meeting as Bill's bedtime stories. <laughs> because that's how you had phrased it, Bud, at our last meeting when you requested it. So Bill is back to deliver one of his bedtime stories. Thank you, Pat. I was going to, going to magnanimously offer to just push mine out till January uh, so everybody could have a lunch break before the 1.30 workshop, which I hear is quite 
um, there's a lot of interest in. So it's your call, but I, 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 don't know. I, can, I can do this in three minutes. Yeah, why don't we get uh, I, I would it? really like to do it in the half hour to to really give hmm. it justice and, and, and tell the whole story, but <laughs> hmm. I'd rather power through because I think people have attended today and to just to hear alter me. the agenda. Yes, yes. Well, to maybe hear this uh, item. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to do that to folks, but I don't I, know. I, it's kind of an uh, without precedent, um, unprecedented to say uh, about mixing up the agenda. So I have okay. never been presented with that scenario. Um, okay. So I think we'll power through. Okay, well, I'd like to call this Bill's wake up story or Bill's good morning story because it's it's a wake up call to the industry. Um, Johan, when you mentioned earlier uh, about cars being held hostage uh, over the Baker Pass, which I was in Vegas last weekend for the race, by the way, so I went over that pass right by the giant thermometer and everything. So uh, that's still happening in, in in certain areas and in certain circumstances. Um, and, and I'm actually glad Pat didn't allow me to push this presentation forward because in January, we're going to start talking about one of those areas, which is storage. Uh, we, we have some facilities, none of them represented in this room, I would say, uh, with all confidence that are still engaging in some, some, some almost hostage vehicle type strategies to generate revenue. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Completely unrelated to my presentation, though, so slide, uh, Zach, let's move to the next slide. So uh, I want to first, I chose a, historically, these presentations have been complaint studies. Um, however, um, complaints are not published on the website because uh, for multiple reasons, so they're not. But accusations are, and accusations within the, accus within the body of the document will describe what took place at the repair facility. So the information I'm sharing with you, although I'm leaving out the names to protect the innocent, and you'll see on the conclusion of the story to protect Barr a little bit, uh, this information is available on our website in an accusation. Next slide, please. And if you click on um, information uh, and you'll have search enforcement actions, and this screen will pop up, allowing to select accusations, um, disciplinary actions, which disciplinary actions, which are final orders of the director, uh, citations issued, and unlicensed citations issued. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about the accusation for Bill's uh, good morning story. Um, Bill's wake up story is a, we had a repair facility, not to be named, uh, that was demonstrating a pattern of a significant pattern of complaints. We're talking uh, 12, 15 complaints or more per year, which any repair facility, quite honestly, I, I would expect to see one or two complaints a year because it's automotive repair. That's the nature of our business. Complaints do happen. Uh, parts, I know none from yours, Gary, from your group, but parts fail and complaints generate and, and so forth. Uh, but you know, so complaints happen, but when we see 15, 10, 15, 20 complaints a year at one ARD, we, we, we become very concerned, especially when the allegations from the consumers, and these are what the consumers are telling us, are fraud, uh, false and misleading statements and oversell. We're going to take a closer look at the business practices of that ARD. Next slide, please. So um, to conduct an investigation, we prepared an undercover vehicle. Uh, BAR's undercover fleet is designed for us to replicate the consumer experience. We can prepare a vehicle based upon what we've seen in the complaints, um, have somebody take the vehicle into the repair facility and act as a consumer. And, and ideally, what we would like to happen is it to be a perfect transaction and we end up paying a facility a few hundred dollars and walk away and um, have no findings. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're pretty good at what we do, so those kind of interactions are rare. Uh, but again, those facilities usually, usually aren't represented in this room. Um, so in this vehicle, we had a, in this investigation and undercover vehicle scenario, we had a mid-1990s model year vehicle with approximately 150,000 miles, and we created a fuel system misfire on one of the cylinders. So it was running poorly, uh, 
malfunction indicator lamp was on and um, happens every day with consumers, right? Next slide, please. So we dropped off the uh, repair for the vehicle, spoke with the uh, service advisor, counter salesperson, whichever their title is there, filled out a customer information sheet, which is our contact info, and left. We did not get an estimate, uh, weren't told how much the diagnosis would be, and um, didn't sign any documents prior to our um, the representative operating the undercover vehicle, leaving the facility, departing the facility. So obviously, we're already starting off on a bad path with this repair transaction. Next slide, please. Same day, a salesperson called and recommended, uh, obvious recommendations for a uh, misfire, a cap rotor, wires, plugs, and a PCB valve. Uh, we were told the parts were bad and worn out, especially the PCB valve. Um, and the recommend, so we uh, authorized those repairs. Next slide. The next day, a technician slash salesperson, this is a different person than we talked to on the first day, calls, and these are all quotes from the, uh, our, the representative who brought the repair the vehicle in for repair, acting as the consumer. All approved parts were installed and the car runs better. Uh, we know better because none of those parts fix a fuel system misfire, but that, that's all right, you know. Well, it's not all right, we were lied to. <laughs> they started out the conversation with a lie. Uh, <laughs> However, the vehicle needed a computer because it was not sending the proper signal to the injector. And as all of you are aware, and those of you online are aware, there's good signals and bad signals going to injectors from computers. I say facetiously, and they probably can't see my eye roll on WebEx, so I'll, <laughs> I'll describe it. Uh, further, prior to the replacement of the, re of the approved parts, the computer got used to sending this bad signal. So the repair facility also stated failure to replace the computer because of its bad signal created a significant risk of piston damage. So we authorized a computer. Next slide, please. Nearly two weeks later, we called and said, hey, what's going on with our car? <laughs> because we hadn't heard from them, which is, uh, th this is a technician. I can't figure it out. So I'm just gonna put it in the corner and ignore it and not tell the customer anything. Um, the technician stated the car was fighting him. The car runs exponentially better, but still has a problem. Two days later, the investigator called and was told the problem has fixed. They found the computer caused extra ohms to go into the injector circuit. Um, test to your comment about Ohm's law. We all know how many ohms the computer puts into a circuit uh, and, and melted two wires together. The circuit became super hot the other side of the resistor in the circuit, the injector resistor. Great stuff. Next slide. <laughs> so we picked up the vehicle, paid our bill, uh, in which we were charged for the cap rotor wires, plugs, PCV, um, and a computer. Uh, upon reinspection, we determined that a resistor within the injector circuit had been replaced correcting the problem. That was the problem all along was the injector. Um, did I talk about it here? Oh, the, yeah, it's the last bullet point. It's exciting, I wanted to get it out first about twisting the wires together, slapping some solder on them and taping them up. Um, the repair facility did not charge us for the injector out of goodwill. I mean, pardon me, the injector resistor. Oh, typo, Pat, you didn't catch that on the, on the review. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> The facility failed to include the resistor on the invoice, which as we are all aware, whatever you do to a customer's vehicle, they need to be notified of what's done to it. Um, even if it's done, the repair is performed at no charge, it's their vehicle, they need to be notified. Um, the facility charged for and replaced the initially re authorized parts. The PCM, the computer, was not replaced as invoiced and charged. The resistor was replaced by twisting, I gotta say it twice, it's just great. And there's, there's, this plays into later in my story here. The resistor was replaced by twisting the wires together, crude soldering and tape. Next slide, please. So we filed an accusation on this, obviously, because there's fraud, false and misleading statements, numerous violations of the Automotive Repair Act. Um, in this type of scenario, at headquarters, when 
bureau investigate when field investigative staff complete a report we forward it to the ag's office they dropped an accusation that accusation comes to me i review it prior to pat signing it to to approve and make sure it's it's appropriate for his signature i will authorize this filing of this type of accusation i i will recommend pat sign it in every circumstance every circumstance in this case at hearing the repair facility and bar argued the necessity of the plugs and wires um, we had replaced them right before the car went in, uh, but the facility put up that they had no idea of knowing that, so on and so forth. Also at hearing, the technician stated that he had secured a different computer and swapped the circuit boards within the computer. We, the, honestly, we were unprepared for such a ridiculous argument. <laughs> we, we had no, we weren't prepared to say, no, that's Im one, it's impossible. Especially now, this is the same technician who twisted wires together, slapped some solder on them and wrapped them in electrical tape. He's removing micro solders inside of a of circuit board without damaging the board and changing boards. Yeah, I believe that can happen. However, we weren't prepared for it and couldn't prove the just the, outrageousness of that we um, the ALJ determined bar failed to meet its burden of proof and promote proposed dismissing the accusation which was affirmed by the director we that that's yeah that's the 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 twist in this in, in my story here is we actually lost this case having said that and what I said before, I will still, we will still move forward, file this accusation, and we will just be prepared. We will have a means of determining whether or not a circuit board within a PCM has, if it's been opened up and replaced going forward. Um, uh, I do know for a fact, the technician slash service writer that made all these statements to our uh, consumer investigator was removed from that facility and is no longer at that facility. He act, this person was actually at another facility and we ended up filing an accusation on that facility. So um, this is a, the moral of the story is through all the good intent of ARD owners and stuff, always keep an eye on what practices you're, and if you see a pattern of complaints, if bars showing up at your door a lot saying, we're hearing things, I, 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 we're, we, don't, we don't stop by to say hi, just, just to say hi. Um, we're there on complaints. Our complaints are an impartial mediation between two parties, and I really encourage you to uh, be open to those when a complaint is filed against your facility, but those on here on the call and wherever, when a complaint is filed against a repair facility, it's an opportunity for BAR to work with the ARDs to address concerns make the the entire industry better and protect consumers going forward that's really our goal in a complaint and and to work out a fair res, fair resolution for all parties so um yes that's my uh good morning story because it's a wake-up call um next is there a next slide zach yeah just my contact info thank you bill i'm glad we did this today <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't want to wait till January. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go to comments, questions from advisory group members. Mr. Conover. Uh, Gary Conover, CAWA. Just a quick question. While you post accusations, are you allowed to post or do you post the determination by the judge? Yes. It is it, the accusations. And in that search function on our website, you can a uh, 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 user can search disciplinary actions, and that's the final decision after the accusation. They're all attached to the license for the ARD. Both the accusation and the decision are there. And those statements made by the technician are in the decision and published on our website. Bud Rice. Bud Rice. Uh, first off, uh, Bill, I, I thought this was really good. Of, you know, in, in terms of being able to tell the story as to something that's live that happened um, and I would be willing to tell you if that table was split in half and the shop guy was on this side and you were on that side and and everybody here that's in the industry has a bias of trying to back the shop guy you know what we you know what happened to him I'm telling you if this story was is this story we'd all come sit on your side no doubt that that, that no was doubt. the goal and, and you should know bud <laughs> 
I'm from the industry. I spent 25 years in the industry and I'm passionate about the yeah. uh, working with the the 98 percent that are just people trying to earn a living yeah. and supporting the industry. Oh, so. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Johan. Great presentation, Bill. Johan Gallo, Cal ABC. You know, it really goes back to one of the arguments we've had for a long time, and we're not going to solve it here today, but the importance of finding a way to register technicians. Because too often, this guy you described that frankly should have been just given a backhoe because the hole he kept digging just kept getting deeper. But the whole issue is they roll their toolbox down the street and put the next shop at risk because of that type of business practice. And if there was ever a way that we could look at doing something different, I know they don't want to license technicians and I'm not going to get in that debate today. It's been going on for 30 years, but the whole issue is maybe we just register them like an ARD. They're just registered. And at least if they're going somewhere and they go down the street and create a problem, you know where they are. I mean, you're going to find out anyway, but you'll know. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Dave Kusa. Thanks, Bill. So I'm going to add a new procedure to my hiring process is to review bar accusations. I'm, I mean, never, I never, never occurred to me to do that. You know, if a service manager or a technician, right, where, where are you coming from? Let's go look at the, at the information on the bar website. And if you got 25 complaints or accusations or those kinds of things, right, it's a deeper conversation than, than just you're hired because you might be hiring the problem. So that's great information. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ruben, Para. Thank you for the presentation. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask, wh what happened to the shop? I mean, they, they didn't follow procedures. They didn't give you an estimate. They didn't uh, have you sign. W was there any action taken at all against that uh, ARD? The accusation was our attempt at taking an action. Um, all of those allegations were listed as causes for discipline within the accusation. And the ALJ proposed dismissing every single one of those causes. Um, not just a portion of them, and the director adopted that decision. So, yes, they essentially, um, there was no penalty. They were put on notice, and again, they, they took a close look at the employment of that individual making those statements. So, okay. and, yeah, I, I'm not going to comment further, but they no nothing happened for those violations outlined in that case. And when you say that individual, you mean the technician, service writer, who? The, uh, the I think it was... A technician slash service writer it was one of those super techs who sells his own service and, and comes up and talks to the customers um, on occasion. And um, yeah. he, I, 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 again, I know he was shortly thereafter working at another facility. Because uh, I would assume he had some supervisor, some management that would have seen this and, and would have not agreed with that procedure. The other thing that I'd like to comment is that that technician probably obviously didn't go to to my school or to or to UTI, right? Because because a lot of times, a, a lot of times, uh, it's not the technician being facetious; it's a lack of education. A lot of times, they don't know how to repair these vehicles, and they're out there with no kind of licensure, no kind of uh, um, you know um, certifications, and 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 they're trying their best. You know, they're trying they're, they're trying to make a living, and it's just a lack of education. I just like to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Additional questions or comments? We'll go to anyone, uh, Bar Advisory Group members who are on the webcast, or excuse me, the WebEx. All right, now open it up for public comment. No one in the room. How about on the WebEx moderator? Could you open it up for public comment on this agenda item? This is a moderator and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like we have a request from Lawrence Wales. Lawrence, I'll request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device.
took a little while to work. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great. Now you commented that the enforcement officers that come out are supposed to be impartial. Last two visits I had from when we got it, it was several years ago, but it, both times it was the same person. Both times his opening remark was as a representative of the Bureau of Automotive Repair, which is part of the Department of Consumer Affairs, we are required to take the customer's side. In other words, and ending it, his statement was, was similar to this. I don't know the exact phrasing, but anybody the Bureau of Automotive Repair goes after, they get. Hmm. Very accusatory. And I won both times, but um, it, the second time when he did that, I contacted everybody I could. Got nobody could do anything because there was no actual com threat. There was no actual phys physical reprimands at that point. Two weeks on the second time he came by, about two weeks later, he said, "It looks like you could have been right." Basically, what had happened is it failed the first time. Took it to to a, a repair shop, they, several items were listed. One of them, imp improper warm up. I told him that I had done two or three. He said, Well, you didn't do all three. I had to show him in the manual itself that only one was required. And he wasn't very happy. He came back a few weeks later because of all my complaints, I think, and told me, Yeah, I could be right. One of the one of the things the dealer recommended was driving the car hard before he bring it back to me. So it passed because of that. And I never did get a notification of the outcome of it, of it, just the verbal thing. There was never a finalization of the complaint being in my favor, anything like that, because he firmly believes that he is required to take the customer side, regardless of the truth. Anyway, that's my comment. If you want to know the name of the person, I can say that too, but I want you to tell me that you want me to say it. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I will speak with all of, I speak with all of my reps, on a, my representatives on a regular basis, and, and we'll address that. Thank you. Also, one other question. I was, I talked earlier and I was told to contact them moderator regarding my contact information and but i don't know how i can do that uh this is the moderator um if you open up webex and uh you see the button where it says q a um if you click that and then um make sure you do send to just the host that way only i get your contact information and it's not publicly <laughs> Um, okay. Post it, and then I can uh, transfer that information to Bar. Okay, thank You're you. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Uh, so our next individual is uh, Gary Zopper Zalka. And Gary, um, a request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. I see we're live again. Thank you for the whole crew for being here. You, you got some great ideas and concepts. Uh, I'm just curious on why all the shops, other than just smog shops, don't have to follow a hourly rate guideline. Only smog shops have to post hourly rates. And uh, for $200, it's a free for all. Anyone that throws $200 to the state of California can become an ARD. Is there any other means that that can be tightened? Are we still there? Yes. Great. Uh, we're, we're here. Uh, correct. In statute and in regulation, smog shops and break and lamp and soon to be vehicle safety systems inspection stations are required to post their hourly rate for repairs. There's no other requirements in there that have been set forth by the legislature. So we wouldn't, we're, our mandate is to somewhat let the market take care of that. And hourly rates uh, are generally affected by local market conditions. And 
if a facility is varying those rates, we're generally going to notice it in a pattern of consumer complaints and, and deal with it there. So. Uh, I'll agree with that partially. They, having been in the business for 51 years, moved to the state and in 1980, had a small license up until recently. Uh, I, I've dealt with a lot of stations, you know, just in conversation, uh, repairs sublimated to me for diagnosis and, and repair in some cases. It, it's a total free for all out there. Uh, I don't know if you guys believe that or not, but from what I've seen, it's a free for all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's about it. I wish I had some other great questions, uh, but that's about all I have to offer for a moment. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Gary. Anything else, moderator? Uh, this is a moderator. Appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Yes, please. All right, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. We'll see. And thank you, everybody, for having me. Thank you, advisory group. Oh, for, <laughs> but thanks for thanks for the uh, prompt for the presentation. Uh, I enjoyed being back up here. Yeah. All right, we've got a couple more things to wrap up. We've got our next two agenda items. They were handouts only. I do not anticipate that there, there's any comments. We've never, I haven't for some time had any comments or questions. All right, uh, moderator, are there any public comments on the handouts? This is the moderator and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q and a feature for public comment members of the public. If you would like to make a comment on these items, please click the Q and a icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your Webex screen or use the raise hand function. It looks like we do have a request um, from Gary Zap Zapperzalka. Let me just ask, is it on the, the enforcement statistics and licensing statistics handout? Because that's what we're on right now. Is the comment related to that? Uh, I see that he still has his hand raised, so I'm going to assume yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so, Gary, I'll go ahead and unmute you. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears in your device. I'm looking at it on my end, gentlemen. I don't have a question for you. My hand's showing down, so uh, maybe oh, touch I... up. Maybe WebEx yeah. is just uh, being finicky, <laughs> but thank okay. you. No, no problem. Glad, glad to accommodate. Uh, like I said, great presentation, gentlemen, and, and females and women, however we wish to address this. Uh, I've had a very good time today listening to the whole presentation. Very enlightening and very educating. Perfect. Thank you. All right, uh, moderator, I think we can close the sure. public comment on these items, and then I'll do our final agenda item. Agenda item number nine, public comment on items not on the agenda. Anything else for the, yes, Bud Rice. Yeah, Bud Rice here. I just wanted to take a, a final moment and thank Yolan Gallo for his uh, participation for all these years and the work that he's done. Thank you, John. Thank you, yes. Well, today's the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something did go wrong. <laughs> I love it. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, it's bittersweet. Today is my last official day as the executive director of Cal ABC. I will end my term in December. So this will be our last get together with Barr and the advisory. And so I wanna thank Chief DeRay uh, for his tenacity to believe in the advisory and what we do. Um, we go back 27 years to be exact. Cal ABC started a summit in 1996 that everybody thought would never happen. We brought the industry together. We brought over 13,000 shops were represented at our summit. At our summit, we set out to change the relationship we had with the Bureau of Automotive Repair. In that summit, it resulted in Executive Order 188-98 that Governor Wilson signed to form the BAR advisory, and it was only supposed to last two years. Chief Marty Keller believed in it so much that he continued it on. This young guy sitting next to me at many of our early meetings was a young man called Pat DeRay. We've worked shoulder to shoulder 
year after year for over 25 years to make sure that the things that we do are the right things that we do. The regulations, the legislation, all the things that we do create a better environment, not only for the consumer, the industry, but the Bureau as well. So as we go fast forward and then look back for a minute, after two years of working with Marty Keller, we decided to award him the ARC, which was our name at the time, Visionary Award for seeing the, having the foresight to believe and support in an advisory where we could actually sit at the table and work with the agency that regulates us. Yesterday, I was honored to present Pat with that award for his vision and his support in AB 1263. He and I had a lot of conversations about that beforehand because he was very concerned that if we codify this, the BAR loses control over why we really do this thing. And he didn't want to do that. But I told him, just like me, one of these days, you're going to hit the door, you're going to retire, and some chief can come in like we had in predecessors who wanted to end the advisory. They didn't like this. It was confrontational. We challenged their staff. Their, cha their staff challenged us. But in the end, we ended up with a better product. So I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, looking at all the work that Jack Maladonoff has done uh, to work with Cal ABC, to work with the industry, to create the regulations and legislation, to fight the battles for things like AB 1263, AB 461. All of these things don't happen in a vacuum. We have a saying in Cal ABC, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you're not sitting with the very regulators that create the laws and the legislation and everything that governs your business, then you're their next target because you're operating in ignorance. So with that, Chief DeRay, I sincerely thank you. Thank you, Johan. I just want to say you'll be missed, and I appreciate everything you've done uh, over the decades now working with the Bureau, with me, uh, causing me and the staff and the Bureau as a whole to self-reflect on uh, the job it does in regulating this industry, um, making sure we have a transparent organization and working collaboratively on solutions to um, help consumers, our, our mutual goal there. And um, I think that we've done a good job um, doing so. And I appreciate your leadership and getting us there. You will be missed. I have to move on. Uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Anybody else? Moderator, I'll have to open it up one last time for public comment. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the advisory group, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, I just have a couple of announcements. Our next bar advisory group meeting will be on Thursday, January 25th, 2024. That'll be our first of the four quarterly meetings for the new year. I hope you can all attend and make it. It will be a hybrid meeting with an in-person and virtual WebEx experience. Um, so look forward to that. And reminder, uh, well, that meeting, we will we will schedule it till one next time. My apologies for today's meeting run, running longer than was posted. And then we will have at 1.30, starting in this room, a workshop on public, uh, excuse me, on teardown disclosure requirements 
uh, as it relates to the automotive repair industry, but mostly as it relates to the collision repair end of that or portion of that industry. So stay tuned and I hope you can join us for that workshop coming up in about 30 minutes. And then lastly, we are adjourning and it is now uh, a couple minutes before one o'clock. Real quickly, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who attended uh, our support uh, for this event. Uh, Matt Woodcheck, the webcaster, Sarah Arani, our WebEx uh, moderator, and of course, as always, uh, Zach, uh, who serves as co-moderator and general support for the, this meeting, advancing the slides and all of the other activities that go on behind the scenes there. So thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time in January. Have a good rest of the year. Thank you.